This is the Literary Licensed Podcast with your hosts, Vicky Ray, John Wilson, and Keith Shorgo. Discussing book to screen and everything in between. Coming at you from the UK and USA. They keep it real. All I did was write that thing on her stomach, and then I hit her about 10 or 15 times. But how come? Well, most because the girl he told me to. Hoover then spoke to one of the Banachevsky children, who told him how the victim was treated. She refused food. We tried to get her soup every once in a while and stuff like that, and she wouldn't take it. Well, how about these scratch marks on her stomach? Who put them on her? I did. Why? Well, Gertie just thought of it. She said, since you branded us, we're going to brand you. So she itched in with a pen, and I went over it. She showed me how to do it, and then I went over it. I, I did it. Did you ever use any hot irons on her? No. Yeah, I... That three on her stomach, I did half of that. Mm-hmm. Shirley Ann did the other half. Where'd the S come from? What do you mean? There's a big S branded on her stomach, right? That's, one of her breath. Huh? that's what I'm talking about. Well, that's what you're talking about. Well, how about the inscription on there, I'm a prostitute and proud of it. Who put that on? I did. Did you scratch it on there, paint it on there? How'd you do it? Well, like I said before, Gertie, throw it down there and I did the rest. controversy. Under heavy security, convicted murderess Gertrude Banashevsky appeared before the Indiana Parole Board and asked to be released from prison after 20 years behind bars. I'm just asking for mercy, nothing else. Banashevsky was convicted of the 1965 brutal torture and slaying of a neighbor's child, 16-year-old Sylvia Likens. The girl was bludgeoned, scalded, tattooed, and starved by Banashevsky and her children while she lived in their home. Banashevsky was sent to prison for life. Hello, welcome to Literary License Podcast. Today we'll be discussing The Girl Next Door, the 2007 film, and American Crime, the 2008 film. And before we get started, today we have John Wilson with us. Say hello, John. 
Hello, folks. And myself, Vicky, will not be with us today because she's doing stuff with her grandson because that's what great, great, great grandmothers do with their grandsons. Wait, I thought it was great, 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 great grandmother. Well, <laughs> uh, she's so old. I think she helped Betsy Ross um, actually sew the American flag. <laughs> 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 so before we get started, let's talk about what we've been up to. So John, what have you been up to for the last past couple weeks? Uh, work has been ever consuming, but at least I got away uh, on Tuesday to go see a screening of Captain Marvel. Um, it was good. I wouldn't say that it was great. Um, I would give it a three out of five stars. I definitely think there's room for improvement in it. Brie, Brie Larson was kind of one dimensional as a character, and I thought she would have been more um, and what, one of my friends was like, basically like, well, no, but that's how she's supposed to be. And her, you know, that's her character. And, you know, I'm just, but I just felt like there could have, she could have gave a little bit more in, in her acting abilities in this. Um, but it was actually refreshing to see like, this is the first sort of standalone film for a female superhero. So they, I think they did overall, they did a good job uh, incorporating her into the, uh, into the universe. And then it'll be interesting to see how they incorporate her into Avengers Endgame. Okay, um, Captain Marvel. I'm not familiar. That's not Shazam, is it? That's Shazam. No, it's um. So she, it, like, I don't want to give anything away, but it's like a character where she develops these powers, and she's part of this sort of intergalactic army that comes to Earth to um, stop an invader. And she kind of realizes, wait, I'm from here, and so there's uh, there's sort of like a parallel. But this movie takes place in the late 80s early 90s so you get a lot of the nostalgia of that time and like she literally comes crashing through a um through a ceiling of a blockbuster video okay. and it's it is kind of poignant because they just someone just posted something about like there's only one left like one blockbuster left video left in the in the world now so it's sort of a dying but at the time obviously it was it's so it's cute so you have a lot of those nostalgic moments of like oh yeah you know uh, something to thank it for yeah it's exactly famous. and Sorry. the other interesting thing is like from the marvel universe it technically is like the first marvel film because it goes back in in that way it goes back to kind of like a time before you know the avengers before i mean it was like the birth of shield you know type of thing but it was like you know an earlier representation before avengers came to be and anything else you've been up to anything you've been watching besides captain marvel or um so i finished uh the umbrella academy brilliant um with that. ellen page obviously from from uh from this the, one of the movies we're speaking about uh loved it i can't wait to see what they're going to do with season two um Love the characters, love the the storylines. I love their abilities, and the, my favorite was the the girl where she's like, "I heard a rumor," and then she would like <laughs> kind of make people do stuff that was like really cool. What about I really you? Enjoyed the um, well, yeah, I shot the Umbrella Academy. I loved it. Um, interesting for people who are fans of it. On Kindle, you can get the first season of the comic books for free if you're part of the um, Amazon Prime. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know that. So yeah. I downloaded those and watched um, been reading those. That's quite interesting. Started reading Room, which we're covering next month and loving it. So, it's good, right? It's yeah. so, I mean, I remember reading it going, wow. <laughs> well, it's, it's kind of thing that when I first started reading it, I was like, oh my God, it's gimmicky like the road. But then, and then I thought like, it's as clever as it's pretentious. But as I'm reading it, it's like, it's not pretentious. It's fantastic. Which like looking forward to cover, could be covering that next month. Yeah. And I watched um, Leaving Neverland, the four-hour documentary with the Oprah Winfrey thing, which is very good. I thought it was very excellent. Um, and for my views on it, if you take the pedophilias um, out of it, the sexual abuse, um, and this is, I guess, we'll, you know, we'll be covering a little bit of this today with parents and the way that they parent leads a lot to be desired. Correct. You know? Yeah. But, the, but I mean, you know, whether you think Michael Jackson is innocent or guilty, I do think that what's quite interesting about the documentary is just the whole grooming process and what happened. And even if nothing really did happen, sometimes you're kind of wondering, you know, where parents go, you know, you know, when you hear people talk about it, like, like, you know, he didn't, you know, he didn't touch the kids and stuff like this or whatever. But it is still quite strange that parents would let a relative stranger share a bed with their child correct because yeah. you know and, and even though that 
parent, you know, he's throwing money at the family and he's throwing money at the kid and stuff like this. It's just, uh, it's just not natural. And no. I know that, you know, he might not have had a childhood and stuff like that, but it is quite rather sad that there's no one to guide Michael Jackson and say, Michael, this is not really right. You shouldn't really be doing this, whether it yeah. happened or not. And it, it's quite an eye opener, but the really good part of that was the Oprah Winfrey, um, Thing, the question answer where she had a, a room full of people who were sexually abused and they didn't they didn't go into the Michael Jackson whether he did or didn't but it was talking about the grooming process and what people don't realize is that people fall in love with the people who are doing it with them because they feel special yeah. and everything like this and it's only after years later that they realize that they can't get their lives back together and mm -hmm. then they and then they realize that this dirty little secret isn't that dirty and that they shouldn't feel that ashamed and have to come to terms with it. But yeah. they had like people like Anthony Edwards from ER talking about, he talked about how he was sexually abused and, yeah. and football players. And it was, so it was quite interesting. And it, I think it's quite an eye opener because the thing is, I think that, you know, taking the Michael Jackson thing off the table, when you look at sexual abuse, it's, I think people have this idea that basically, you know, someone's forced down and raped and that's not the case, you know? Yeah. And in some, in some of some of the situations are consensual and it's it's when it I mean, obviously, when it's a, an adult or a child. Yes, because there's there's something there, like you said, like what what parent would be like, oh, you know, Michael wants to have a sleepover, <laughs> you know, and you're like, you know, your kids coming over and it's like, mm, you know, you would question that. Um, but well, we we're talking we we're talking about it at work. And I said to the girls, I go, would you let me share a bed with your child? And they go, yeah, it's you. And I going. I go, no, really. I go, think about it. You don't know. I go, you don't know yeah, me. Don't, yeah. You don't know what happens when the door closes. And well, yeah. They go, and, that's, and they go, that's no. The thing. Thinking about it, she goes, you know, the thing is, I say that to you because you're asking me and I'm talking to your face, because I don't think I would actually let that happen. Yeah. And I go, and I go, I think that's, I think that's the problem. And I mean, you know, with Michael Jackson and after the Jordy Chandler case, and, you know, he did pay, he did pay to make it go away for whatever reasons, whether he was guilty or he just, you know, he was just making him physically ill because yeah. you know, he needed to get away from the situation for whatever the reasons are, which we'll yeah. never know. It's up, to, you know, it's something. Yeah. I mean, it could also have been under the advice of his lawyers to convince him to say, you need to do this, you know, too, right? So well, it, was, it, was Johnny, know. it was Johnny Cochran that was his lawyer. And we kind of, yeah. you know, after the OJ Simpson thing, we knew kind of all, you know, we've, we've seen the virtuosoness of Hollywood scandals and Hollywood and how that all works yeah and then and then when you get oprah winfrey doing her documentary after that fact and then it's like you know he's got two other boys and you think and you, and you know you're just thinking to yourself like michael what the hell are you doing you 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 know you, you're you setting yourself up again you know what yeah. i mean yeah. it wasn't the brightest i mean the things we do i also think that he's he because from, in, from my perception of the way he was i mean i felt like he was a child trapped in a man's body and like I don't know if there was just something in him that just wasn't able to grow up or wasn't able to, to be, you know, a man in his mind. I feel like he was always like a boy and maybe that caused, you know, if you think of a boy at that time or that age is exploring his sexual, whatever awakening in himself. If you think about it from that perspective, it's like, you know, a teenage boy, you know, as a 12 year old is wanting to experience something with a boy or a girl at that same age. Mm -hmm. If it's the mind's trap, like mm -hmm. you kind of have to go, it, it, it's what happened to them. Like what, what literally happened to him to kind of regress his mind? Was he abused? Was, I mean, you know, and there's also, if you look I, at that family, yeah. each one of them had their own sort of issues. Latoya had her own issues. Janet had her own issues. You know, the brothers had their own issues. So there were things going on in that family that lead to, you know, this sort of thing for him. Well, what know? I find interesting is that the Jackson family always talk about how we're such a close family. We're such a close family. <laughs> but when you hear about from any of these kids or anyone that hung around Michael, the family never was around, you know, yeah. like, you know, and you think that a close family, I mean, even my sisters who are, you know, you know, I see them every two years, but we talk all the time and, you know, we do have physical contact and, you know, and, 
And I do think that if you have a family that's closed, at some point, someone would sit there and said, Michael, the plastic surgery used to stop. You know, I don't think yeah. he had any, I don't think he had anyone in his life that could tell him no. But yeah. then, I mean, the things we do know about him, I mean, he was a drug addict. I mean, he was, he was addicted to prescription drugs, every yeah. since the Pepsi commercial. And, you know, and maybe he was very alone. And maybe when you have that bit of star quality, maybe, you know, your whole world, maybe the world may be open to you, but maybe you're still closed off from it. And, yeah. I you know, mean, imagine living as a, as a, you know, ex- introvert, you know, in a extrovert environment and always having the f- cameras on you. And when you're hanging out with people like Elizabeth Taylor and other people like that, you're, the camera's always on you. So that, well, I mean, can't, I can't say that, it's not going to mess with your psychosis, you know? Well, if you look at his adult friends, I mean, they're not the picture. I mean, they're not the mental health community yeah. at all. I mean, yeah. Elizabeth Taylor was messed up. Liza Minnelli. Well, we know that she's messed up. David Guest. Well, he wasn't the pillars, you know, yeah. mental health either. And even Yuri Geller, which was another close friend. And then you look at you know, Corey Feldman and, and Macaulay Culkin, they both have their issues as well. So it's like, you're yeah. looking, you know, and these are the people that are your close friends and, you yeah. know, these, these, you know, I mean, I don't know, Coley and Corey became adult friends later in life. Yeah. And whether, you know, I know they go, well, sexual abuse didn't happen to them. But I think, you know, if sexual abuse was on the table and it was something that was happening. I, I really don't think he's going to sexually molest people that are in the public eye anyway. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. I don't think Michael Jackson's that stupid. But at the same time, I mean, when you look at Michael Jackson, and if you think back about it, every year there's another boy. And they, yeah. and it, and you know, and then maybe the reason why these people are coming forward is maybe it's abandonment issues as well. I mean, yeah, you know, he used this, you know, he saw them for the whole year. All the attention was on one of these boys, and then when the new boy came around, that was it for the old boy. Out with yeah. the old and with the new, and maybe that maybe sex, maybe nothing sexual. Or, Inappro- well, it probably was inappropriate, but as far as how far the sexual abuse may have gone is yeah. questionable. But maybe, maybe where all this is coming from is abandonment issues because you've, yeah. you've now been replaced. The, the, the world, the sun of your world is gone away. And yeah. maybe, maybe it's just simple abandonment issues is why this is coming forward. Yeah. But, you know, the man is dead and I don't think we'll ever know the truth. I think there's going to be lots of speculations on yeah. one side or the other other i don't think those speculations would ever go away but it did paint a picture that we're dealing with even though he was a megalostar i guess is what you have and I, we'll never see that megalostar again sort of thing because it, yeah it's time you know there's not gonna we know we're not gonna have another michael jackson we're not gonna have another madonna we're never gonna have another beatles none of that's ever gonna happen yeah. again yeah so, so this is a time and you know at the end of the day there he, he's human and um and you know, I guess he'll have to answer to whatever God he prays to if anything did go wrong. And if mm. nothing goes wrong, he's doing whatever he's doing. But you also but like, you know, know seeing, like look, looking at these films that we're going to talk about, too, you know, sometimes you're the product of what your environment is in that sense. And you don't we just we won't ever know even that truth. Right. Because the family members each have their own perception of what went on in those families. And some of them said, oh, we were great. We we're close. And then others say it was horrible. It was dysfunctional. And, you know, and oh, so, yeah. You know, we're going to run back and forth through all that sort of thing. So, yeah. But besides that traumatic experience of leaving Neverland, I've been, I finished up watching Ink Masters, got caught up on that, finishing up my, the Sister Wives. <laughs> so oh my God. Still like, really, what, you know, started watching Real Housewives in New York and we're watching Beverly Hills. So, you know, oh, you know, I'm watching too is the second season of uh, Star Trek Discovery. It's really good. Like, oh, it's, it's really, really good. Really good. I, I, yeah, so it it's the the story is definitely picked up more, and they're kind of diverging in different directions. And it'll be interesting because they said CBS said they want to do I think at least four series, and one of them are going to see what they're going to do and where they're going to go with it. But it's good. I say anyone of who's a who is a tracky, you know, to to tune into it because I feel like it's it does it justice. You know. Well, Xbox is giving away a free Star Trek film. Uh, is it online? Uh, no, uh, game. Sorry, a Star Trek game. It's oh online. yeah, the online RP. It's like an RPG, right? You can. Yeah, and it also Star promises Trek. that it doesn't hold it. It's not one of those free online games where you know you have to purchase stuff. Yeah. So apparently, you don't have to. So I downloaded. It. I haven't played it yet. I'm, I played a little bit. It's just so. Di- it's so. 
massive because it's like again it's a universe so you have to kind of go to different universes and go and you have to like go on different away missions and do things and sometimes you can work together if you have like a team you can work together but you always have to come back to the star base and like learn because you're you're like a cadet like you're learning to be a starfleet yeah and then you i think you get a position as a commander and then from there it's sort of trying to rank to something or build to something. So if you want to be in medical, it's like, do you want to be in the medical Bay area? Or if you're in engineering, you're going to be there, you know? So it's really interesting. Uh, yeah. So it's not like a normal game where they drop you in the middle of the action and then you build yourself up to, for the final battle. So I mean, you kind of do, I mean, you you kind of pick and choose to go into which different scenarios, like you can go against the Borg, you know, there's a time when you like, meet us in this quadrant we're getting attacked by the borg and then you could fight the borg go with your ship and fight the borg and you know okay yeah well, i downloaded it i mean i just finished far cry uh the new dawn which i loved and now i'm cracked down three i'm playing at the moment and then i still got red dead redemption and assassin's odyssey <laughs> I, well. I actually want to get um anthem which i'm looking forward to getting that and then um there's another one that's coming out that I was like, oh, I want to really get that too. I still have to. I want to get the third uh, Tomb Raider too because I I really enjoyed the first two. Are you? Do you have an Xbox Game Pass? Uh, yes. Mm-hmm. It's, it's for it's for free. Oh, it is. Yeah, I I played that um, last week. Sweet. I'm gonna get it because I I lo- it's great, right? Did you play yeah. the other two or no? I yeah I, I've I played every Tomb Raider that's come out. I'm a Laura Croft fan. Yeah. Um, you know, I remember when the first game came out back on the old PlayStation One. PlayStation One was it, or just yeah. PlayStation? <laughs> and playing that, and you know, I always made sure she died because it was quite funny watching the guy go. Ah, ah, ah. Uh, <laughs> and her body all crumple. And she looks like a little rag doll, and she falls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, getting spiked and all that sort of stuff. And you know, worked my way up. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, like most franchises she had some pumps and grinds in some of her games but i still play them and this new lot is really good especially like when the, the beginning you know and then when she has to first kill someone then there's a lot of it's a lot more emotional resonance goes on in it now and it's yeah they've done a and really there's, good and there's more learning right like the first one you literally are learning how to survive and then what you know is in the second one as you kind of develop those skills but they're always like skill based like you're always learning how to hunt how to fight how to shoot you know yeah and I think, you know, they, they're, they're doing a really good job with it. It'd be interesting to see how much further they go with it. Or, you know, cause it sounds like this is like a trilogy. So what are they going to do after this trilogy? So it'd be interesting to see what they do with it. But if they keep on, if they keep on this road, I think they're going to, you know, yeah. do her just. The um, I mean, DLC for in the second game was good because you kind of go back to the manor and you explore the manor and you kind of find clues or you kind of find history about your mother and like, who she was, and maybe it's the second one that's on the Xbox. Then no, it's the, it's the second. It's the second one, Shadow of the Tomb Raider. That's the second. Yeah. One. Oh, okay, so the no, newest the one, um, Dawn or Rise of the Tomb Raider. Like I can't remember what the new one is. Where it's like more Mayan based. It's like a jungle based one. So um, oh, okay. Oh no, that one's not there. I, this is Shadow of the Tomb Raider. It's on the Game Pass. No. Yeah. So the new one you will like because it it just came out. I think this past year. Okay. Well, I will purchase that eventually i also want to purchase Res- resident evil 2 the the reboot oh yeah it looks it looks crazy uh, one of my friends was playing it and i was like wow it's much different from the original <laughs> from the original one right well, I'll tell you one. i remember the bad a- voice acting chris yeah. hey jill <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh my god chris <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've come a long way our way out <laughs> It's like, oh, okay. did you hear that sound? <laughs> yeah. Oh, Chris, the walls, watch out. <laughs> like, yeah, one of the best voice acting ever. And yeah, so I probably I will do the Tomb Raider in Resident Evil. I gotta finish the game. I gotta. I mean, I'm, I'm I've learned to, you know, pace myself. That no, you know, no sense buying a game until I finish what I have. Sort of. Yeah. Thing. So. Yeah, I do the same thing. I play like four games all at once, and I have to be better at just like finishing, you know. Yeah, games, which is I why I'm, I'm trying to finish, it, finish uh, it. Kingdom Hearts. I'm trying to finish that one, so I'm almost done with that. Oh, I finished that. I loved it, and you know, make sure you watch after the credits. That's all I'll say. Okay, but hmm. I love you know Kingdom Hearts is brilliant and um, so well done, the- so well crafted. You know. Uh, the only thing I can, the only bad thing I can say is that when I finished it, 
I was slightly depressed. Oh. Oh, well, wanna, do you, you just want to you, you want to finish it, but you want it to go on forever. It's one of those torn. Well, do you know that they are actually doing a DLC for it? Yeah, yeah I heard that. So that's yeah. the reason why I haven't have taken off my Xbox. I haven't made room for other stuff. Yeah, <laughs> like DLC. DLC. You're like I'll keep it on there. Yeah, <laughs> keep it on there. And then maybe I'll go back and do it on hard. I think it's one of those games I I will return to. Yeah. The only the only thing I do wish is I wish that X. Box would I wish they would remaster the first two games and bring those back out and do like a whole refinishing, but you never know what the future lies. So I thought they did though. I thought they were they PlayStation. Were that. Oh, PlayStation. Oh, okay. But you know, I. But then again, I don't know how much the rights are. You know, I mean, a lot of the voice acting. You know, we had all the original voice acting, so maybe their contracts might be up as far as a reboot onto Xbox. Maybe there's yeah, maybe some licensing or something like that. True. But other than that, not a lot. Oh, I'm very excited because next week, or actually tomorrow, is American Gods Season 2 starts. Oh, I heard about that, yeah. So I'm looking forward to that. And, of course, we're going to be very busy with Game of Thrones coming soon. And OA is coming. I know. In a couple weeks. So oh my god, the OA, week. I just can't. I've been dying for this to come back. And so when I saw the trailer, I was just like, Ugh, it's so good. It's such a great show. And people, you have to almost stick with it because I had friends who kind of were like, oh yeah, I watched two episodes. I didn't really like it. I said, you have to like, you just have to stick with it. It's such a brilliant show and so moving. To me, it's like Game of Thrones. I mean, the thing is, I remember when Game of Thrones was just when it first began and after the first season was over, um, my friend Debs is here from Canada and we said, okay, let's watch Game of Thrones. Let's see what see what is. So we watched season one, liked it. I had a hard time following it because I was thinking there's just season. a lot thrown at you, right? You're just like, what, what, what do well, I you, need to know? <laughs> well, you can't. The thing is, I found out you can't think about it. And then when season two came out, like a couple months after we watched this, I'm looking at this guy. You know, I, I don't know who the fuck these people are. I had no clue what the hell You're was like, going who's on. Who and what's going on? And so I stopped watching it. Then two two years pass, and then season four starts. And I thought, okay, I'm I'm going to sit down, and I'm just going to. I'm just going to watch it, let it wash over me. And by the time it got, now I'm like a huge instant fan. It's like, I found that if you watch Game of Thrones and not think about it, but just let it wash over you, it all makes sense. And the yeah. OA is like that. If you just yeah. watch the OA and just watch it, don't think about it. Don't try to, ter- you know, diagnose it or, you know, or whatever. Just watch it and then let it wash over you. By the end of it, it's such a rewarding experience. Yeah. And that's, you know, that reminds me of the Game of Thrones that way. You, just, you can't overthink it. Just watch it and yeah and i say any show that you watch that by the end of the season if you're i mean me i was literally standing up and just in the moment of it like really caught in the moment of it i i i just get some of those types of shows i get emotional on that the oa i got really emotional on. i was like wow okay why am i crying right now this is really <laughs> i'm like wow this is really good writing uh game of thrones is like that way it's like i get i'm standing by the end and my heart is racing and i'm like what the hell and then you just kind of left there and you're like <laughs> you know like now i have to wait <laughs> Well, I think Game of Thrones, I mean, I do now watch it week by week because I'm now an avid fan. And same with Westworld. Westworld's the same kind of thing. You can yeah. think it when you watch the first season, you don't know what the hell's going on. And then, you know, by the end of it, everything's just popping together and everything's like, oh my God. Like, yeah. And I have to sit there and say, what I'm looking forward to about the OA is the teacher. I yeah. love her. I love her too. I love her, love her, love her. Um, I like the direction, not to give anything away, but like with the trailer, but I like the direction they're going and it mm-hmm. it actually opens up more questions. Like now I'm like, what the, f- what the hell? <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, well my so housemate sorry. Gary's friends have been working on the OA for the last year. Um, oh, really? And I keep oh, going, uh, he goes, I go, well, what's going on? What's going on? Because t- you tell you truth, because I'm not even asking him because I don't want it to be spoiled. And I said, no, yeah. I, don't, I don't want to be spoiled either. So, yeah. But yeah, so guys, a lot to look forward to. So now I guess what we'll start doing is talk about The Girl Next Door 2007. Now, before we um, start talking, um, there's some of this stuff that's pretty heart wrenching and horrible. But basically, we're talking about two movies. And what we're looking at is the fictional aspect. Two, there's this murder case of the Soviet we are like in murder case and basically what happened is jack ketchum uh, was so disturbed by this when he was growing up that he wrote a fictionalized account of this murder 
And then they made a movie out of it in 2007. But at the same time, the fictionalized version was coming out. Showtime decided to do a dramatization of the real case, and that's the American Crime 2008. For those of us, for those of us that don't know anything about the Sylvia Lichen, Sylvia Lichen basically was born in Indiana, at Indianapolis, and in October 1965, um, a 16-year-old was basically held captive. And to go back to the story just a little bit, what happened is um, she was the middle child of five siblings. Her and her sister Jenny um, were taken in by this person they didn't know because the parents were carnival workers and they paid twenty dollars a week for this this woman they didn't know to take care of their kids because they were and they would like farm their kids out during the carnival season um basically what happened is is that one of the elves um gertrude um baronetsky basically was a single mother of what was it five children six children yeah i think it was five five yeah. children and, you know, she, she's a woman who just had her child, you know, started, was married, had a child at the age of 16, um, had had children and got to the point. And then she had an affair with a younger man and who was basically six years older than uh, six years older than her oldest daughter, had a baby through him. So she's got, you know, it's just a woman that's under pressure, takes in these other two kids. And it's a woman who had mental health issues. Basically, the course of the three months that Sylvia Lincoln lived there, what happened was we started out with you know, beatings with belts due to um, late payments coming in that would actually escalate the torture and murdering of Sylvia Lincoln. Um, what would also happen is the kids would take their turns beating her and they would invite their friends and they would put cigarettes out on her. They tattooed, uh, I'm a prostitute on, on her stomach. Um, they would rape her with Coke bottles and, and the abuse. And this is just like the tip of the iceberg and this, yeah. and they would starve her to death. And when they would give her food, they'd give her soup and tell her to eat it with her hands. And by the time that she died, she was so dehydrated. She couldn't even cry tears. It's pretty much the overall story. If you want to know more information, there are interesting um, case files on YouTube and Wikipedia and places like that that can go into more details. Now, The Girl Next Door was written by Jack Ketchum. And as I said before, Jack Ketchum uh, was so, this is one story that would never leave him. And he, he said, and before Jack Ketchum died, we had a literary agency and we were, you know, I knew Jack Ketchum. He wasn't my best friend, but we knew him and we had a couple discussions. When I asked him about The Girl Next Door, he said that um, he... It's something that he could never get rid of. It was always there, and he had the only way he could do it was to write a book about it. But he didn't want to write a in cold blood Truman Capote style book. He wanted to make a fictionalized account of it because he said because of the facts of the case, he didn't want to go to. He wanted to hit the details, but they were too gruesome to be realistic about. And we're talking about an author who wrote books like Offspring and Big Red and books that are very, very brutal in their violence in his books. And he found this case to be too brutal to write a nonfiction account of it. So he wanted to fictionalize it. And then what he did is he did it from the, the point of the perspective of the boy next door looking in on this. So that way he wouldn't have to go into too much detail because he found it very disturbing. And he found this writing experience to be quite um, cathartic for him. So what transpired is that he wrote The Girl Next Door. It did very, very well on um, the independent books sale, and eventually they decided to make a movie out of it. And it took about four or five years to get the movie rights together. And then we, what we end up is The Girl Next Door, which is an independent film, which is very interesting. So, John, let's start talking. Well, well before we go into um, The Girl Next Door, what we're going to do is cut to a commercial break and the trailer, and then we'll come back and go into more details about The Girl Next Door. So we'll be right back after these messages. Amazon. Oops, wrong Amazon. Although we both contain an array of diversity, the rainforest with all of its animals and us with all of our products, come check us over today and find all the products you need quickly and efficiently. And buy it with one click. And now you can even use us to donate to your favorite charities using Amazon Smile. Amazon Smile is worth your while. Come check us out today. <laughs> one sound down here 
and I'll kill the both of you. Nothing in my life has been right since the summer of 1958. Time when even the guilty displayed a rare innocence. See anything? Not even a goddamn elbow. Hold it. Hold it. We'll wait. He wants to sleep over there again. What? Next door? I'm Meg. I'm David. There are two young girls living at the Chandlers now. So? I hear you better. Oh, your cousin. Yeah, down by the rock. Cute too, ain't she? What's that? They were in an accident. Both parents died too. Mom says he must have died instantly. You just dropped by to get this to David. She's something, isn't she? Mrs. Chandler must love having her around. Tent worms. I'll do this one, and you can do the rest, okay? I don't want to. David? Hey, Nick, how's it going? I haven't eaten in almost two days. This hates me. But I'll do it. I don't care what you do anymore, bitch! Yours is this goddamn bitch! Nothing I ever do is right. It doesn't sound like the roof I know. Not so fun when it's your precious sister getting slapped around. Teach you to pick on people your own size. You brought a cop here. After my mother! Best policy, mind your own business. Say you stay out of trouble. So you think any more about it? About what? Getting big into the game? We got our own game now. You want to think about one thing, girl. Well, two things, actually. First... It could be your little sister hanging here instead of you. And second, I know some of the bad things you've done, and I'm kind of interested to hear them, so maybe this confessing isn't such a kid's game after all. I can hear it from the one of you, or I can hear it from the other. You just think about that. <laughs> no! So welcome back. So John, what are your thoughts or information about The Girl Next Door, the 2007 film based on the Jack Ketchum classic? Um, this movie, oh my god, it uh, I was telling you or speaking to you earlier, it's it's just a lot. Like I, I felt like I was thrown in the deep end of the pool. <laughs> like um it's really really tough to watch. Um if you're if you're sadistic and you love abuse and you love watching someone being tortured, it's the right movie for you. Um but I I think to me it was one of those films that you just can't believe something like this could happen to someone, but yet it did happen to someone. And um, it, it it again it just kind of pushes the the line. So even for an independent film, it starts off sort of whimsical in a little way, and then it just keeps going deeper and deeper and deeper. And before you know it, you're kind of like in the abyss. You're in the basement with um, with her and. It's, yeah, it's just very, it was, for me, it was very difficult to watch. At times I had to kind of like turn away or, you know, when she was getting abused, I kind of had to fast forward a little bit. It's like, I can't, like, it was, it was just too much. It made me nauseous, you know, at times. Um, but I knew nothing really about this. I mean, other than, you know, Keith had mentioned wanting to explore doing this movie and doing um, an American crime and the two of those uh, movies together, I had no, no knowledge of it. So I kind of went in blind watching them and then I read about the actual case and it's just, it's just a really sad and um, just, you know, d- terrible, disturbing um, story to even think about being told, you know, but it, it's very important that it is told too, because this poor girl, like, you know, what she went through and um, you know, it's just, it's sad, you know, it's really, really sad. Well, this is one of Stephen King's, one of his favorite films, actually, The Girl Next Door. Yeah. And what, what he said was the first authentic, authentically shocking American film he's seen since Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer over 28 years ago. He says if you are easily disturbed that you probably shouldn't watch this film. But on the other hand, you, you are prepared for a long look into hell, suburban style. The girl next door will not disappoint. This is the dark side of the moon version of Stand By Me. Yeah. Now, I thought it was interesting that they changed the names of the people and stuff like this. And I understand that he wanted to do an, a fictionalized version of the count. But, you know, once we get into a, you know, American crime, we can discuss the more and more of the differences. But 
outside of the name change, there's not a lot of difference. The only differences there are is that um, the two sisters are, she's, you know, she didn't have polio like in real life. She was the victim of a car accident that killed her parents. So they went to go and live with this aunt sort of thing. And this and yeah. the story, which I guess kind of lets the parents off you know, which we'll get into in American crime. So basically, and I guess it gives them that nowhere out, but I thought it was interesting that they did it from David's point of view, the boy next door. So he doesn't really take part in the abuse and the kids coming in and taking their turns and the rapes and all the other stuff that goes on in the story of yeah. Meg in this instance. And I thought that was quite interesting. So therefore, what you could do with the film is that you can make a lot of suggestions about what's going on and you see it through David's eyes. Correct. Yeah. And then, and you get, and then you get David as the savior type, but at the same time you get the book end of the film, which I think works very, very well. Cause you got David as an adult and he, you know, basically he sees a man get hit by a car. He goes home. Basically you can tell that he's been in multiple marriages. He hasn't told anybody about his past or anything like that. And he, pulls out the picture that may gives him and then we go back into this kind of story book started out as like a storybook you know whimsical coming of age film which yeah. is quite interesting i thought that was an interesting way to play it and yeah it's also quite interesting that may looks a bit older than what she spoke you know than this real story and i, I don't know if they did that to I'm not quite sure why they made her older. I don't know if it's because of the nudity that was like was expected later on in the film. Yeah. Because there's not there's not a lot of nudity in this film. There's like one quick shot of her hanging nude. But it was quite interesting because she did seem older than David. And if David was gonna be some kind of boyfriend uh, or friend or maybe, you know, event you know, I, I, he seemed to, he seemed to be quite smitten with him. Yeah, but he did look, but the age difference was a little bit jarring, I guess. I agree. And she looked like she was in high school and he looked like he was in middle, like, you know, junior high. Like it was a yeah. four or five year difference in age. Yeah. Hmm. And I also thought it was quite interesting that unlike the real stories that the houses are not as close together and that we do have David's parents played by Grant show, who's now in dynasty and Melrose place and Catherine, um, Mary Stewart, who did like Night of the Comet, big 80s actress in her time, playing the parents, but they don't seem to know anything that's going on next door, which I, yeah. I'm not sure, you know, I read the book ages ago and they seemed to quite, they were quite oblivious in the book that I, that I remember. Which is interesting because in the account, in the real account, like the neighbors actually were fine with the abuse if i remember like reading some of that like basically at one point the neighbors actually came over when this was happening and they were kind of like yeah you know you should be you know you should you know punish your kids you know whatever and it's like you know to see that is i'm wondering i i mean it could be from the perspective of you have to have a, some sort of a balance so they're like the neutral party you know that's just doesn't get involved and doesn't you know, want to know what's going on. Maybe they did, but they just didn't want to get involved, you know? I think we're probably dealing with, with an age where what goes behind closed doors stays behind closed doors and you don't get involved. Yeah. Because you cause you do hear a lot of stuff like in the 50s and 60s. I mean, we're talking about mid-60s here. So, And we're yeah. talking about a small town. So well, we're not this, like I was going to say, wasn't this also a film? It was almost like it took place in the 50s, not the 60s, because I remember it opening saying 55 or 50. So it actually, it was an interesting choice. They went a decade earlier for some reason. Yeah, they went to 1958 in, yeah. in this one. And, you know, the real case took place in 65. Yeah. But I've, I'm not quite sure. Maybe it's as, maybe because the fifth, I guess in our mind, I, I guess if you put it in 60, 65, 65 at that time, you know, Kennedy was already, already assassinated and America started changing in the views yeah. of America. That's, you know, basically yeah. when Kennedy died, America's innocent side. So I guess placing it before it's 1963, in this case, 1958, I guess it shows America is very innocent. And in the fifties are always considered very innocent. I mean, if you look at happy days, happy yeah. days, very innocent. But then if you look at some of the sixties, it's a bit, there's a bit more taintedness going on than anything that's yeah. set in the sixties. And there's also when things do happen, you know, my, my friend was actually saying this as a, as a child, she would say that during that time, 
if a parent or you heard argument, you just didn't get involved. That wasn't the neighborly thing to do. You just kind of let people deal with their own households and you just kind of stuck to your own and you, you watered your hedges, <laughs> you know, while you hear the husband beating the hell out of his wife. It's like, Oh, well, none of my business, <laughs> you know? It, yeah. I mean, but then again, to, I mean, you know, I was talking to Isaac earlier today about just the way people are. And to be honest, things are not that different nowadays. Cause the thing is people don't get involved. They may film it and put it up on YouTube or whatever, but they're not getting involved. I mean, yeah. there's this um, video footage um, that one of the girls had at work that they, someone sent them on their phone. Um, I don't know who, the people I work with, I don't know who their friends are, but they always send these horrific videos of things happening. But basically, on this video was this guy, he gets out of his car, goes to this woman, and he's beating the shit this woman. And meanwhile, this person is just filming it. No one's saying anything. I mean, instead of filming, she should have been calling the police. But it's just, it's just, it's just kind of weird that you're seeing this kind of stuff now. Now, I know that a lot of this video footage, we're not getting contact. So we don't see how it begins. We don't, you know, basically. But still, it's a very act of someone being recorded. While, like, like a, there was an incident in New York where someone was pushed, pushed onto the train tracks. Like, they were attacked. And you had three people, different vantage points recording. But no one literally helping this person. No, and it just it just makes you wonder. I mean, I guess I know that we're like saying, "Oh, here we are, the best of times." There's so much as people, but I don't think we've really changed that much because I mean, I do believe there's some people like I know, you know. Oh, uh, I know. Yeah, is where I've been, and you know, I've seen something. I have to say something because I've witnessed something horrible happen to someone that I care about, and so I know how that would feel as if you know, seeing something and not really doing anything about it is is. It's hard. It's difficult, but you have to because otherwise, how do you live with it? You know, how do you live with not trying to have said you've done something? You know, you know, I, you know, I'm the kind of. I mean, I was brought up that if you see something wrong, say something, and you might have to fight for it. And I, I mean, I have, you know, I got, you know, scars at the back of my head where I was hit in the back of the bat, head with a baseball bat because I saw someone attack somebody and I stepped in the middle of it. Yeah, you know, I did. You know, I got. I. You know, not to blow my own trumpet, but I did, you know, I, you know, they look worse than I did by the end of it, which I'm, you know, I'm not saying it's a great thing that I, you know, that you, that violence is a good thing, but sometimes it does cause for that. It didn't start as yeah. violence. Well, you stopped it too. So you were able to. And I stopped it. Yeah. And, um, and I think that, you know, sometimes you might get really hurt doing something, but, you know, if I die doing something by helping someone else out, yeah, it might be sad, but at least I've done something. You know, I always think, you know, standing idly by and watching something happen, then what are you going to do afterwards? Oh, my God, I should have done something. And that's what's quite interesting about the girl next door because you have the neighborhood kids, and they're coming in abusing Meg in, in, the, in the movie, The Girl Next Door. Yeah. And they're, and they're all just doing it. And it's like, I think it's and like a theater, ass, it, it felt like such a weird occult thing, right? It was like – you know, it wasn't so much a household doing this to her and treating her, which we'll, you know, we'll get into when we get into the other film. But it's like, this was just some really twisted fucking kids who who just wanted, like, the one little boy. He's like, can I burn her? You know, you're like, what the hell? Like, <laughs> But, you know, he's also the same kid, like, putting ants on worms and watching them being devoured. You know, he's like, he's just crazy and sadistic. <laughs> well, and then you had like, the, the older kid coming in and, I mean, this and the girl next door. This is what's a bit weird. You got this older kid that's hanging around with all these young kids, which is kind of weird. Yeah, <laughs> takes us back to leaving Netherland, but, no, but it's kind of weird. <laughs> but you're thinking like, okay, and then it, and he's coming in, and I, I do know that maybe Jack Ketchum, when he was writing his fictionalized version of the Soviet Life, in case that maybe he was making composites and things like this. Yeah, but I'm not quite. But if, if they're trying to make a statement here, I wasn't quite sure what that statement is. Like with some, I mean, I know like sometimes things happen within a family and the family will go along with it because it would be like, if it's happening to this person in the family, but it's not happening to me, I'll go along with it because, you know, it's self-preservation. Well, I think they also just made it like Ruth, the type of character is she was just a degenerate and that she was encouraging other kids to be degenerates, right? Because it was like, I think only two of them were her kids in this and the rest were all like street kids, right? Yeah, and she'd be like, come in, come and have a beer, you know, come. And you, you knew she also slept around and she also had her young boyfriend, which was played by, um, what's his name? Um, uh, oh my God, what am I his name? Huh? 
What, James Franco in the American Crime? Oh, that's right. No, in, in James Franco. Yeah, I'm getting mixed up. But, like, in this, it's like, again, she's just sort of a degenerate, right? You know, and she's just in, encouraging other kids to be degenerates, too. And so imagine these kids who all live in these white picket houses and their moms and dads tell them, oh, you got to do the right thing. Now get to do whatever the hell they want to do. You know, burn a girl, cut a girl, you know. <laughs> it's like, yeah. oh. Tattoo a girl. Oh. Um, I mean, I found it. I mean, in this book, I mean, I have to sit there and say that um, Blanche Baker, who basically, um, oh, I can't remember her character's name now. But she's the, you know, the woman who. Ruth. Ruth, there we go. Sorry, yeah. I keep on call her by their real name. <laughs> I keep on calling her Gertrude for some reason. But um, Blanche Baker um, as Ruth, I have to admit that what we get with Ruth in this version of the story is we don't get a lot of backstory. We get a woman who's kind of past to prime. We know that she was, you can tell that she was beautiful once, but she's not beautiful no longer due to life choices and wear terror, how her life turned out. But and, and you know, and she she's kind of this is a kind of a black and white character that we have with Ruth. You know, basically yeah. she's just what you see is what you get. But it's the way that she looks at things, and it's almost like the judgment that she's making on Meg are the judgments that she have about herself. Correct. And well, in this one too, I mean, it's it's heavily. There's more boys in the room than there are girls, and the only girls really that are in the room at, when. This, the abuse starts is the two, you know, the girl and her sister. And so it's almost like you're, you know, you're a dirty girl. You're like whatever that religious thing in her mind. I don't know if it is religion or she's just using religion as a weapon. And she's just like, Oh, you know, you, boys only want one thing from you. And it's between your legs, you know, like these comments yeah. is like you said, because, and she met, she says it too. She says like, she's been left like men are useless and they're going to leave you and you know, they'll just use you. And, and so you could tell it is a reflection that she's seen this young, innocent girl. And all of a sudden she's not innocent and she's a whore. And she like, you know, like it just, it goes from one end to the other where she's at first nice to her. And then when she doesn't get her money, it all of a sudden becomes something, it just goes a whole other direction. And she but, was always sipping that cough syrup. So part of me was like, hmm. did it insinuate because she was drunk or she was drugged up and that's, that's what caused her to be more mi- malicious? I think it might be jealousy as well that maybe she saw a beautiful, innocent girl and that's what she used to be. And yeah. I, to me, I mean, in, in The Girl Next Door, it, to me, it all comes from a point of jealousy yeah you know and it's like you know look you know i mean it doesn't help that she has sarcastic sarc- you know sadistic children i mean her i mean in the fictionalized version it's quite interesting that in the real story it's mostly girls that are involved yeah. in this. and the fictionalized version that they're boys and i guess it i guess doing it that way makes it a bit more easier to understand that a bunch of boys would attack a girl yeah and a bunch of back in a girl to the way that they, you know, in the real case, I mean, they basically dehumanize the real Sylvia. And it's kind of hard to imagine another woman dehumanizing another woman in that fashion where it's easier to see boys do it. Because even in, even when we get the two girls, the friends here that come in and see it, they're kind of only there and they're, they're drinking their Cokes and Blanche, um, Blanche, um, Ruth is, you know, screaming out her, ideologies about this you know this little this young innocent virgin girl who's basically the horror babylon and the while that happens and the way men are going to treat you yeah and then you know and then she you know she does a bit of torture to her but then the girls are drinking their coke and they're kind of looking at each other like and you can tell that they feel uncomfortable Mm -hmm. and but they don't really return to the scene of the crime not like in the original when we get to the original story where it's like (laughs) every you know they're all taking turns, like, beating her, kicking her, beating her, punching her, yeah. But we don't, we don't see the other girls here do that, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? You don't, they don't, they, we're not seeing them take part in it. We, we see the boys taking part. and they have I that. feel like there, I think there was, like, some punching or kicking, but it's so unnoticed because I feel like it's, it's also, remember, they, they pull in this very wicked game that they created or concocted as kids you know in this in the summer you do things like ride bikes and you know go get ice cream and you play torture games out in the middle of the woods (laughs) like 
<laughs> so they took that game and they told Ruth and Ruth is like, Oh, you can have a game. Well, we can play a game with her. And I think they, because they were playing that game, it was part of the game. Like, well, I double dog dared you. Okay. I guess I have to kick her now. And then I kick her, you know, and it's, it, mm-hmm. it became for them. I think it was more like a game, but at some point, at one point when they saw it was more her torturing her. Yeah. Then they kind of, we're, we're just going to stand back here and drink our soda. Yeah. We're not going to do anything. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, because they, they they were involved like in the tickling and like pushing it around sort of thing. Yeah, but um, but yeah, they kind of like you know they kind of re- you know it's just like they, and then they kind of get they get kind of removed from the script. You don't really see them again. And it's, yeah, and I, I'm I'm not quite sure what I mean. I guess maybe because it gets more about the. I, I mean, I don't know if it's because let's show how bad boys can be in the power of an elder woman or something like this. Yeah. But then again, the abuse in this movie is slightly different than the realistic cases. Cause I mean, they, you know, there's one point where she's got her eldest son raping Meg. Yeah. And then the young, and the young kid who looks about eight, go, can I have it? Go, I don't know. We're going to get David da- da- needs to, because it's going to be like incest. If you mix your spunk with your brothers. Yeah. You know, <laughs> Uh, sort of thing and you know and I think maybe but then maybe it also has to do with you know maybe in the film production they thought that these two girls who are basically you could tell that they're 16 years old for real you know they're they're not yeah. they're not 20 playing 16 year olds and maybe they figured that maybe these girls shouldn't be watching this being filmed maybe that's the reason why maybe it has yeah. more they more, removed him removed they removed well it's him. also something about again they remember they sneak to see her in the middle of the night and they're like, Oh, we're going to get caught, you know? And it's, it's just that it's, it's such an insidious thing where these boys all want to do something to her and, and some of them want to hurt her and some of them want to sexualize her, you know? And it's, it's just, it just amplifies that fear for her. It's, I just felt, I mean, I had a problem with, with the, the boy, David, like, I, I mean, he just seemed to still, it's like come over and watch all of this happening then it was obviously eventually it gets to him and he feels like he has to do something to stop it but this is after like a lot of abuse like a lot a lot of abuse and so i just to me it was like i you know and he would never participate in the abuse at one point you would think you would just be very quick to tell your parents or quick to tell anyone and just to intervene you know so as part of that i get it was like him being the the one person who's sort of the morally sound one that's sort of outside of that circle, he still was inside that circle. And that was just really hard. And I don't know if that was based on whether or not one of the kids in, in the real account of what happened to her did something or was the one who intervened. But it's like, I just felt like, yeah, I just, I did. It was unbelievable for me because I was like, I can't picture a kid just being like, I'm not going to do anything. I don't, I mean, I guess if it's kind of weird because we the film does open with David going, "Oh, Ruth, isn't she great? She's like one of us." And da 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 da. And you have all this thing about how great Ruth is in the beginning of it. And of course, is it as we go down the dark hole of you know Ruth's sanity and things get worse and worse. And I understand what you're saying, and I'm also kind of wondering if if maybe it would make more sense if David took part in it, and if David took part in it and felt guilty afterwards. Then I would, you know, I can understand him not saying anything to his parents, but because he didn't Correct. take part in any of it, yeah, it does. It is a bit weird that David doesn't, even though David does try to save her at some point, yeah, you know, which causes her death, really, him trying to save her, because yeah. because she tries to sneak out. And sorry, listeners, but basically what happens is Ruth blow torches her vagina, yeah, which causes death in this film, and um. You know, but then we, but we do get things that where David is trying to save him because David does call the police at one point and the police show up, which makes things worse for Meg. At the yeah. end of the day. Um, I thought what what's interesting about the real case and this is that Meg is all doing it to protect her sister. Yeah. yeah. And to protect her sister from getting hurt. And it tells you what kind of, you know, and I thought, you know, when you look at the realistic account and then you look at this version, I thought Jack and the makers of this film did a really good job of keeping the spirit of Sylvia alive. Yeah. Yeah. From what we know about her. I mean, and and it's also just sad because in the real account too, they mentioned that at one point 
they, you know, she says to her, like, you have to abuse your own sister mm-hmm. because if you don't, this is going to be you. And so at one point, you know, or a couple of times, I guess she hit her own sister and it's just, yeah. it's got wrenching because you're just like, she's doing this to protect me. And now I have to do this to her. And it's just that whole, that part of it was also really hard to watch. Like imagine. And, and in this film, she is very much like, has the braces on her legs and she can barely get around. And so imagine someone who's, who's crippled being uh, punished and beat, you know, and, and she just immediately steps in is like, I'll take it. Like I'll, I'll take the damage, you know, I'll I'll protect my sister. And it's just, yeah, that, that, that's added a whole other level of that. That's really twisted and messed up, you know? And I think the girl next door is, it's even though it's the real story is a lot more heart wrenching. And when we get to American crime, it's a lot more heart wrenching because the girl next door is that they got no one to turn to. There's no one there for them to turn to because their parents are dead in this fictionalized account. And so they're stuck there. Yeah. So you can, it's a lot easy. It's not easier to stomach, but it's kind of, it makes it easier to understand why the girls are stuck in this house and that, that they can't leave, and that I mean, the torture does happen. There is nowhere for them to go. There's nowhere for them to go. And even when the police show up, they're still. And I can understand why they're more trapped. You yeah. know what I mean? Because there is nowhere for them to go. There's, they're just trapped in in there. And you know, even the police, even when the policeman shows up, he, I mean, and the policeman does show up at the end, and which is quite interesting because we don't really, and I don't know because it's an independent film, and the, the film is. It's a very the film's film like a night like a TV like a sadistic TV movie first of yeah all, the film yeah. quality is and stuff like this it's independent saying that all the actors are very very good everyone's very very good but there is a there's not any outside of the shock of seeing the torture that's going on there's not a lot of emotional depth to the film that you're you're kind of an outsider looking in on all this so correct it, yeah so you don't. You know, and what you've, you know, and outside of David, which is like your protagonist and you're seeing everything through his eyes. And I'm not sure if this makes, this is clever filming or is it just so shocking that it's not so clever? It works. And I I do like this film. You know, I own a copy of this film because I'm a Jack Ketchum fan, but it's not one, I don't watch this film on repeat viewings. Correct. You know, it's there. um, And... I mean, I bought it 10 years ago and this is probably the second time I've seen it mm. sort of thing because yeah. it's heart wrenching, but it's quite interesting to have this. And then, um, you know, when David does try to save her, it is, you know, it is a kind of half hearted attempt because first of all, you know, her arms are, you know, she's tied up with her arms up in the air. Her limbs are not really working. This girl's starved to death. Yeah. She's not being fed. She's not being watered. She's been tattooed across the, you know, stomach, which... Her vagina's been burned, like, literally, like, there's not, like... <laughs> yeah, and then he, like, leaves, you know, he leaves money for her to go save herself. And, you know, in the course, you know, she tries to save herself, but she gets caught because she's trying to rescue her sister, and then mm. that's what causes her downfall. But you just think that you know, maybe because David's so young, but you think to yourself, like, why don't you just come in the middle of the night? Because you go in there in the middle of the night and no one sees you and just help her out the door. Yeah. Or it, well, that's what I was going to say. He he really didn't try in the sense of, you know, I'm, I'm going to set this up for you, but I'm going to help you execute the plan. Because he sees how, how weak she is. You would think, okay, or how about you go and get other people, other, other, you know, neighborhood kids or something like be like, Hey, can you help me save this girl? You know, yeah, I can't believe it. part of me is like, so they're all evil. Like literally like all these kids, you know, wh- there's not a single other kid who's in that town. That's going to be like the good one and be like, Hey, let me help you out here. <laughs> you know, or well, wake your parents up. Hey, mom, dad, I have something to show you. you well, know? another like, interesting thing as well is that um, when, Meg is dying, and, is, and she's got her su- sister Susan there. And Susan says to David that um, that the reason why Meg's protecting her is because Ruth has been molesting the girl with pol- the the crippled girl Susan, her sister, been touching her until she, yeah. bleeds, until she bleeds, and and that 
that, um, and that, and they give the reason that the reason why Ruth's doing this is because Meg knew and Meg said something to Ruth, which is kind of like an afterthought. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, yeah. oh, like, so what? So that's okay. I don't know. I, I don't know if it, I can no, because when I heard this again, it's like I took more notice of it because when you watch stuff for the podcast, you tend to take more notice than you normally do. And I think, it, and then I thought to myself, I was like, is this to give Ruth a reason? Like, they're have like you need to have a reason to be such an asshole or sadistic pig that you are uh, yeah. it's kind of on or was yeah. this to show that meg is so good that she's taking all this abuse to still save her sister the point putting that point across again yeah it could be i mean yeah i mean i i caught that too and i thought i mean she's being abused so no matter what you you got to get out of there, but that's like I think she does. She did hinge it like I'm just going to take all this abuse, and I don't know where it's going to lead me. Probably to death, and you know, but it's going to protect my sister. Oh nope, not going to protect her because she's still getting abused. <laughs> You're like, uh, yeah. you know. But I did find it. I mean, we did get like this Hollywood 1950s code ending where the villain has to pay for the crimes. In this case, we get David blundering Ruth to death with. Susan's crutches. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Which is kind of like, it must have been quite hard crutches. <laughs> they were just wooden crutches, they were like tiny Tim crutches. But, and then we get, you know, Meg dies. And, and then you get like this message, you know, because then we go back to now, which is 2007. The present, what would be the and, present, right? Yeah, and David's still haunted by everything that happened. But he's left with this message that Meg gives him that it's what you do last that counts. And you kind of finish going, oh, what do I do with this? Because I don't know if what you do last counts. Really, you know, it's a bit like, you know, it's a bit like, it kind of leaves a sour taste in your mouth. A bit like Anne Frank kind of leaves a sour taste in her mouth when she says, I believe people deep down are good. And then you realize what happens to her. Yeah. And, you know, even though it's like a nice sentiment and it's like, it's a lovely, you know, it's a lovely thing to remember someone said that they said something that's quite warm to your heart. It means something, but because of in the context that it is, it's kind of sour tasting. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure if it's supposed to be like this, you know, this, you know, a little glimmer of light and this, you know, whole story of darkness, (laughs) but I wasn't quite sure how to take that. <laughs> I mean, you're left. It's also interesting with this too. You're literally left with him reflecting, like pun intended. Like he's sitting there <clears throat> on the riverbank, looking into the water, and it's like the first time he met her, and he looks over, and she like. I was like, but the, he's still. He's not going to go on and live in a happy life. He's he's reflected on that. He hasn't moved on from that. I mean, he's able to tell us that story, but the way it began was pretty much like if I remember correctly saying how his wife was complaining about how horrible her life was. And he goes, and the bitch doesn't know what she's talking about or something like that. And sort of like, then it's like, well, let me tell you a really horrible story. (laughs) And then you hear this really horrible story. And then it ends with him on, you know, on the riverbank, you know, wow, I'm so glad I was able to reflect on that horrible story and I'm moving on with my life. And like, no, <laughs> like, yeah. I think you're not going to move on with your life. I think you're just going to go back to that cabin, open that bottle of whiskey, pour yourself another glass and recall that whole story over again. You know, you know, I think with the wraparound story, I think it would have been more rewarding if we had a man that's life was in ruins and more worse than just his marital problems. Yeah, because you know we open up and he's basically a well-to-do solicitor. We go into his room, we go back to his house um, be- before he starts reflecting back on his idealistic boyhood with these sadistic pigs living next door. And you know he's doing well. I mean, he's he's drinking scotch out of a crystal yeah. tumbler, which is yeah. basically you know I am a professional yuppie and I'm doing very well for myself and a richly decorated study yeah and it, and obviously the study is in his house you know and i don't know where the wife is she must be upstairs sleeping we don't we, just, we never even see or her. no she might not even be in the picture because he's been through so many divorces so she could well be... no he did sit there and say something about his wife now something. yeah um, so it's so obviously you know the ex-wife is this but then he's got this you know because the current wife is the one who was attacked by she's trying to tear two cats apart and the cat disfigured her body with their claws 
Yeah, something like that. <laughs> yes. Or she doesn't. The bitch doesn't know pain. Yeah, yeah pain. Is. Is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what, that's where that line comes from. He's like, she, the bitch doesn't know pain. <laughs> Let me tell you about pain. <laughs> yeah, my friend Meg. And I do think that you know. And then we get this story. Then we get this you know this horrific story, you know, about this girl he couldn't save that he didn't really do anything to save, and the, the, besides the punitive, tr- the, you know, ways he tried, which you know wasn't enough. And then he becomes successful at the end, you know, and you're thinking to yourself, it's like, maybe it would have mean something if this guy's life was total ruins. Yeah. You know, like, you know, he's poor, he's, you know, there's, you know, he's just struggling to get by. And because he didn't do anything, it would have it affected him so much in his life. Yeah. Because of the guilt and the horror that he's seen and, you know, and, you know, though he, you know, he might have been a bystander, but if you're a bystander and you're watching someone get murdered, you you, you, can be, you, you know you're done for manslaughter. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. you're part yeah. of it. If you don't, yeah, do you're part of. That's why I'm surprised. Again, he wasn't though he was there to help. In the end, I'm sure they're going to ask him. Well, but you witnessed all this go happen and you did nothing, so you were you're not an innocent bystander. You were you were you helped in that way. You know, you didn't do anything to stop it. And it was very simplistically done, really, because, you know, at the end of this, we don't know what happens to the, her sons. We don't know what happens yeah. to the neighborhood kids. We yeah. see them, you know, and this is what's even weirder. You, it's like, here, I'm going to take Susan, the crippled girl, you know, the sister of the girl, my Meg, who's been murdered, who's seen her sister being murdered. And you stay here with may why I take her sister upstairs and you're thinking and that that was that whole scene was a bit odd with the police officer yeah i mean again it's he first of all doesn't he um walk in and he's the kid is over the woman with the knife or something and i mean you would not uh, i'm i don't care no, who you are he's trying As to a cop it's the yeah. uh, it's the brother is um Ruth's son trying to kill david Oh, okay. Because I got I, that, I got mixed up. Because I was like, well, then you wouldn't be like, just go. You would, you know, you'd be like, oh wait, what are you doing? Stop, you know. Um, yeah, it is weird. He kind of leaves her down there. And granted, the the sister she doesn't appear injured. You would think you would tend to the person who's injured, and immediately like, I gotta go get and you know an ambulance or something. You know, I gotta you know call or do something to where I can get these people, you know, uh, her help, you know, you wouldn't just be like, I'm going to take the healthy child out of here. I'll be right back. <laughs> like, yeah. It's just, it just felt odd. It just felt, I think weird. it, I think it was meant to leave the two of them alone. And if it's you have that moment, oh, David, yeah. you did what you best could. Cause you know, it's what, it's what you did last that counts is to get that. But you couldn't even hear her that moment before too. she dies, you know, but yeah, and you, but you couldn't even hear her. Cause she was like, <laughs> I'm like, well, you know, probably she could even talk to be honest after everything yeah. she's been through. I mean, I mean, yeah, she was starved to death, dehydrated, concussed. Yeah. God oh. knows what infections are running through her body. I mean, it was horrible. It was just horrific. And yeah, and I've said that even though The Girl Next Door is an interesting film and it's it's done very well, it it doesn't give you any kind of it's kind of like walking into a situation in the middle of it. You see it happening and then you walk away from it without seeing any conclusion. And that's yeah. what the film feels like to me. I also don't know what would have triggered him to even have this moment of, I need to reflect on this story because it, it opens where he's leaving work and this homeless person gets hit by a car and he goes and he helps the person. I, w- I, think, I think it would have made more sense if he walked away and did nothing and was like, wow, I've done this before. Have, haven't I learned anything? And here's what I remember. This is what happened before, you know, and then have him reflecting on this thing. It's like, I think what the filmmaker did here, because I picked this up and I had the same thing that you did, but I actually picked it up this time, is that when the homeless man, he's, he's br- trying to bring the homeless man to life and the homeless man flickers his eyes and he grabs the homeless man's hand and they're holding hands. And then when Meg's dying, they hold, they hold the hands the same way. Oh, and it's very, very miss that. and that's but but saying that, you know, would that make you reflect back to a time yeah. that you watch someone being horrifically tortured and mutilated? Well, 
and, and Ray didn't he say something. Like, did he say to friends. me, he's like, I kind of wish I was actually hit by the car instead of him? <laughs> like, it's like, wow. Mm. <laughs> and yeah, I guess, you know, I, I guess the, I think, I mean, as I said before, I read the book and the book, I think you can get away with a lot more in a book with this because you I remember reading the book and you you know it, the book is in the same format as the film you, know, you get the man you reflect you back and then you hear the story but you get a lot more inner thinkings of david than you do in in the movie and, it, and i think the book works slightly better than this film because all you're you're trying to feed stuff into david what he's thinking and because i think david the person playing david is very very good but he's very young and i don't think i think maybe he had Haley joe Al- Osment doing it or something like that you might yeah. get a bit more about what's going on behind the eyes maybe uh-huh. and maybe it might flush it out a little bit but we don't get a lot of flushing out and i also don't think it helps that we get a glimpse into david's life and he has like the normal everyday kind of family we got the beautiful grant show who's always beautiful and we got Catherine mary stewart who's very beautiful and they're the ideal 1950s fantastic couple and they have their fantastic yeah. you know nice looking beautiful little boy that michael jackson probably saved over <laughs> i'm only kidding <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah you know what i mean and then you and then you got david going next door with you i mean and let's face it i mean when you look at ruth and you look the way that she's living her life and and let's say that you're living next door to that and you see kids coming in and out of her house all the time would you feel very comfortable about your boy playing next door with Correct. A grown woman who has no, yeah, exactly. And you know, you can't say that you don't know that she's drinking either, because that's the other thing is like, you wouldn't, you don't see any of that. Like you don't see any of her. And granted, she always had a, even with the police officer that shows up, she's like, Oh, hi, hello. Would you like some iced tea? You know, like she's, she does turn on her, you know, Beaver Cleaver, (laughs) Mrs. Mrs. Cleaver, you know. Um, Well, the amount of beer that she's drinking in this film yeah, I mean, you know, when you're taking your garbage cans out and your garbage bags out to the side of the road for the garbage men to pick up, you're going to hear a lot of clanking going on. Like, yeah. You know, bottle clankings and beer can clanking. Yeah. And she's, and another thing, she's offering alcohol to the kids in the area. I mean, the underage kids. I know. know that's and, insane. No one, no one knows about this. Like, I mean, either this is the worst block of parents that the world has ever known. Like, none of the parents are like in and, any sort of clue of what's going on like to me i'm like really and what makes it even worse is grant show or david's father runs a bar right yeah. and yeah. you don't think and the mother obviously is as prim and proper she doesn't go to the bar she does whatever ladylike things that a 1950s woman is, is doing at this time because yeah you know i mean i'll be and they do make this you know, when you do see the family eating dinner together, Grant's kind of like, you know, boys with boys sort of thing. And you got the mother's like, oh, you shouldn't be over there. They got two young girls there. And she's very prim and proper. So we yeah. know, so because of that one scene, we know that the mother's very prim and proper. And she's, you know, built, you know, she's the perfect 1950s housewife. And that, and, but then we got David going over there. And, and Ru- Ruth says, time and time, Dave, Davey, would you like a beer? Davey, would you like a beer? Yeah. Yeah, and you know that Davy drinks beer and then goes back home, and the mom's not smelling it. Who is a non-drinker? Who or even the dad who works at a bar? Come on, like seriously, you don't, you know? Yeah, I mean, it kind I of mean, I, me I, guess I, I was, I was yeah. even saying like the, I thought about that too, and I thought if if she is the way she is too, Ruth is the way she is, and she even I think at one point makes a comment like, "Oh, your daddy," you know, like, "Oh, I know him," you know, <laughs> and I'm like. Well, how do you know him? Do you go to the bar? And then I'm like, oh, she probably does. And then, so, and then, I mean, this her son too is this rebel, right? Who's out there cleaning his car. And so, again, as a parent, you'd be like, I don't want you hanging around Bobby. Like, he looks like he's a bad boy. Like, don't hang around him. You know, I, again, I just think it's either the, the block with the worst parents <laughs> that ever existed. <laughs> like, literally, all of them are like, I don't care. <laughs> They're well, not they here. Do- well, they did make David's father seem like he was quite the the guy who slept with anybody, and yeah. and that David's mother is the one that tamed him. Yeah, you know they get they kind of give you that a little bit, though. But then again, we we're hearing this through Ruth's demented view in life. I mean, she's demented. Her view in life is demented. 
the mm-hmm. way that she looks at things. So can you take that as fact? Or True. so that yeah. that's another thing that, you know, maybe if you had a conversation between, um, you know, more inf- more interaction with David's parents, maybe maybe you could accept it more. But you know, when you got a character like Ruth in your movie, and she's the epitome of evil and sadisticness and darkness, and there's no light whatsoever in her eyes. Yeah. Anything that comes out of her mouth, it's like, how can you take any of it as truth? Even though maybe they go, oh, maybe that maybe they're trying to give you some back backstory on David's dad. Yeah. But you can't take you can't. It's, you know, yeah, you can't take it as fact because she she's just so jumbled as a person. Yeah, and especially if it says the same in the same you know in the same breath as she said that all men want is what's between your legs, and I used to be beautiful once, and all the men loved me, and you know, and it's like you know, and then meanwhile, David, your dad was like the stud around town. It's kind of like, well, you know, when you do it all in one breath, it's kind of hard to sit there and take any of it like with a grain of salt. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> sort of thing. But and. It, I mean, The Girl Next Door is a very, very interesting film. It's quite, I, what I quite like about these two films together, it's quite interesting to see a real case being fictionalized. And, of course, we are now going into an American crime, which is basically the documentation type film made about the original case. Mm-hmm. Now, the interesting thing about um, an American crime is that it's a film done by Showtime. At the same time that uh, The Girl Next Door in 2000 seven was trying to be made um 2007 started american crime starring Catherine keener and ellen page and basically what they did is they ran with their film and had it in time for um sundance film festival which did very very well and showtime would pick this up and they would premiere it in 2008 so it would take a year for the show of this film outside of the sundance film festival the film was nominated for a Golden Globe for a primetime Emmy, um, both for Keener's performance, which we'll get into later. And um, it is more about the case of Sylvia Liking. But like The Girl Next Door, they do sanitize the actual case to make it more platable for a viewing audience. Yeah. Um, what we do do is we got, we're back to 1965. We do have the real, the real case that we will discuss after our commercial break about and there's more realism in it, but what we do this time around is we kind of get a more humanistic version of Gertrude, the real woman's life, a little bit more. And we we kind of get, I guess, an explanation how she is, what she's like, why, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what we'll do is we'll cut to a commercial break and to the trailer for An American Crime, and we'll be back after these messages. Morning face. You get it when you don't sleep well. This is what happened to Linda. Morning, guys. Good morning. Ah, what is that thing? It's me, Linda. Oh, my God, it talks. Run! No, it's me, Linda, from HR. It looks hungry. Save the children. Save them. What? Stay back. I've got mace. Ow, that went in my eyes. We're moving. It's called beauty sleep for a reason. And there's never been a better time to get some. Get 20% off IKEA salt and mattresses. IKEA, love your home. Why don't you leave Sylvia and Jenny here with me? I got six kids. Two more won't make a difference. $20 a week and you won't have to worry. I want you all upstairs. So for you too. Your daddy's check didn't arrive today. Oh, it's probably just late. Lean over those. She needs to be punished. How long until Sylvia's out of the basement? Until she learns her lesson. Did anyone order you to hit Sylvia or tie her up? What are you, chicken? If I'm a silly can. Did you do anything at all to help her? What come between Gertie and her kids? You don't like it much. I don't understand. And why did you do it? There are things in life we have to do, whether we like it or not. favorite scary movie 
Um, I have a bunch of favorite movies. I watch them all on Shutter.com for only four ninety nine a month. That's a scary low price. But if I had to pick a favorite, it'd probably be Scream. Oh. Yeah, it's the only streaming service that lets me watch hundreds of horror movies on demand. Uh, I'll be right back. Hello? Hello? Hello, are you going to subscribe? Hello? Go to Shudder.com to subscribe, if you dare. Hello, welcome back. So, what we're going to discuss now is American Crime, the 2007 film that was starring Ellen Page and Catherine Keener. So, John, what are your thoughts of an American Crime? Um, I really, really, I mean, I'll, first of all, I love Ellen Page. I mean, she's just great. Um, I like that she did a great job sort of paying homage to Sylvia because it, it was. It, it's reflective in a way that it's from her perspective, unlike, you know, American crime. It was from a, an omnipotent, you know, like person who's on the outside of everything going on. It's coming from her. So when you're watching this, you know, having someone recount the horrible things that happened to them, but then realizing they're dead and, and that's sort of how it leaves you. It kind of sat a little bit deeper with me. Um, and she, again, I think this film if it is more of the account of what really truly happened, I think it did a really good job in kind of painting the the neurosis of um, what was her name Gertrude, um, painting her neurosis in a way that was less like she was just crazy, but more she it was a happened of circumstance of living in a impoverished environment with her kids and hearing stories you know, that her, her daughter, you know, Paula had made up about her. And it kind of was like her way of like, I'm going to punish this girl for telling lies about my family. And I'm going to, so it, it made it a little bit, I guess, more pliable to why she was doing the abuse. But then it just was also just really sad because you, you, I think some of the abuse in this film was more, what other people said she did that she didn't do. And they were, they were torturing her because of it. And I, that to me set a little bit deeper, like, wow, you know, this, this girl who is, and they paint her, you know, they paint Sylvia as a good Christian girl who went to, you know, went to church with her sister and that her mom and dad just had to go and work and, and she just gets put into this family that in the beginning that they're, they're, they almost welcome her with open arms and they play with her and they tickle her and they include her in their, their lives with such, such joy that, to then turning into something so horrible that she doesn't even know why it, this is all happening to her, you know? I think now the thing is, is that um, the cast who did this film knew nothing of the real story. After they started filming it, they found out, they started getting things about the real story. And when Catherine Keener um, was first offered the role, she turned it down. Yeah. And, but she couldn't get the story out of her head. So after she talked to um, Tommy O'Haver, who directed the film, um, she decided to do the film. And I'm wondering if they made some changes to help make Catherine Keener do the film. Because Catherine Keener is fantastic in this film. I'm not taking mm-hmm. anything away from her. Um, performance whatsoever but what I am going to dispute is some of the reasoning that they use in the film for Catherine Keener's character and they try to find a reason why this happened to a certain point where they try to make her sympathetic to a certain point correct and I had a little bit of difficulty with that because when you find out the original reasons behind it there's not, okay, yeah, okay, she might have been off her meds and stuff like this, but, and at some point it made her sound like, you know, she didn't know what was going on, that, you know, she was just kind of, you know, she was like she delusional. Off, yeah, yeah she's delusional and off her meds. But, you know, the thing is that a lot of the abuse that happened when you go through the court transcripts and then when you go through the actual case, she was very, very much a part of it. It wasn't just going on in her basement with the neighborhood kids. I mean, she mm-hmm. she instigated a lot of it, and she was, you know, she was encouraging them as well. Yeah. And you know, and the simple fact that you know, if it was a bunch of teenagers doing it, I can understand. But when you get the kids, the little kids. I mean, these are little kids. I mean, 
I think the youngest is like five or six. Yeah. And, and then they, and they rally all the way up to 17. I think Paula's 17 at this point. And she's the eldest. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, and the thing is, they're all taking part in this. And they're all taking turns and they're all kicking her. And I mean, one of the boys, and, and I have to sit there and say that they do sanitize some of the stuff that goes on in Sylvia in the film. Because when you read the actual case, I mean, one of the daughter's boyfriends is coming in and uses her, and he was practicing judo and karate, and he would practice his moves and, like, kick her and yeah. uh, judo chop her in the face and all this other stuff. And another thing that I found that was a bit odd that I wish they kept in this film is that Paula hits Sylvia so hard in the face that she breaks her wrist, and they put a cast on her. On a real, and then a she real continued cast. To, can then continue to keep hitting her with it, too. Yeah. And hit her with the cast to the point where she broke her cast and had to have her cast remade at the hospital. It's and and they they do I would say from based on this movie versus American Crime, like uh, I'm sorry versus uh, a girl the girl next door. Girl Next Door is very brutal. So I think if you take the elements of the brutality that she went through in that movie and you put it into this movie, it would be a little bit more authentic um, because it is really washed down. And you don't, you know that she's down there for days being tortured, but it kind of goes by in this like very quick sequence that you don't really know how much time is happening and what's happening. And, and she's laying in the same spot. Whereas in, in the other movie, they're constantly stringing her up, putting her down, putting her on the bed, laying her here, kicking her, picking her up, tying her to a post. Like I, in this, it seems like she's not as tortured as what, what really happened. I mean, and then in also what happened to her too, is it made her eat her own feces and eat the baby's diapers. I mean, it was the real account of what happened to her was so much more gruesome and grueling that, they do kind of humanize the mom and make it seem like, oh, poor her, you know, that she thought her daughters were being picked on. And she, it was more of a retaliation thing that I'm going to teach her a lesson versus a crazy person who was allowing multiple people to come into her household, whether it was her family or kid, kids in the neighborhood to torture this girl. Mm -hmm. That, that to me was also hard to watch. Like, kids coming in from school and being like oh did you hear about the girl in the basement oh my god and they would come down and like kick her and like punch her and you know Put cigarettes out her. on her yeah i mean that to me it was like holy crap like that that was you know bad because you know in, in the other one it was like the fam more of a family unit and still some kids but this was like a hey what do you want to do this afternoon let's go torture the silver girl <laughs> you know like yeah. wow Ugh. and you know, and then and then there's another scene that in the in this version that I can understand why they put it in because it made Catherine gay Catherine Keener this sympathetic moment. But when she's down and Sylvia has been beaten, cigarettes put out on her, and just before they decide to tattoo her, um, Catherine Keener is like wiping her face and talking to her, and you're thinking, you know, and the thing is. You know, okay, if this was a story, if this was a work of fiction, I can understand this, but we're talking about a woman who sadistically and calculatedly mutilated and tortured and did every disgusting thing anyone could ever do a human being and, it, and orchestrated this and encouraged this. And let's give her a kind moment to show how human she can be. Yeah. And, and it kind of feels unsettled for me because when you look at the real Gertrude story and you hear about the real Gertrude and you hear, and you, and you do look at, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there about the court case and stuff like this. And, you know, the thing is she doesn't take responsibility until after she's released and just before she dies, five years before she dies, she also admits that. Yeah. I'm, I'm, and she says, I might've had a hand in it. Yeah. You know, this is a woman that feels no remorse. So why are, so why in this film are we giving, these tender moments that, you know, she's yeah. off her meds and, you know, she just, you know, she just misguided. She just wants to protect her children because when I'm, she was on the stand, she didn't protect her children. Yeah. Well, and I think she it's interesting herself. that moment that you're talking about where she, you know, basically you, you think it's going to end because it's like, Oh, she has this epiphany that what she's doing is wrong. Right. 
and the mom like she's you know she stops and Gertrude stops and is wiping her face and it's okay we're gonna we're gonna bring you upstairs and everything's gonna be fine and then I forget what happens but it's like another lie is told to her and immediately she like basically throws her ass down the stairs you know and you're like it's so it's so like I think it's just a Hollywood thing. Like, let's give this moment where you think the girl is going to be fine yeah. and that the woman's going to do the right thing and stop this madness. And she just goes full tilt crazy and, and just does far more worse things to her. And I also sit there and say that they over they paint over some of the cracks in this story. I mean, one of, I mean the real case is that Gertrude was going to murder her. They said that she ran away, which they did keep in this film. But they actually dug a hole in the local park where they were going to bury Sylvia. Yeah, yeah. In the real story. And the thing is, is like, and you know, and then, you know, when Sylvia does die, it's like, oh, she's just faking, she's just faking, and she's going to go off into her mental state or whatever like this. And then we, and then we did get Paula trying to rescue her. Now, I'm not sure if Paula tried to rescue her because there's nothing in the original case that says Paula tries to rescue her. Yeah. Or Paula yeah. ever shows her any kind of <clears throat> kindness whatsoever. Yeah. And, and then you get this thing about, you know, her, and then you get the story in this as well that, you know, she's trying to protect her kids because that's what a mother does. But, I mean, let's look at the facts of the case. Her kids were wayward kids, first of all. Yeah. Um, her one daughter was never coming home when she's spending nights at her boyfriend's house. And she's about 14, 15 when she's mm-hmm. going out with an older boy. The Paula is going out with a married man she, who fall pregnant with her. And so they're and they're they're used, they're saying here that the reason why in this what we get here is that you know this is what instigates it because Sylvia's lying about her daughter. Yeah. Well, the thing you know, your daughter's seeing a married man first of all, and the thing is, you're living in a small town, and you think it's Sylvia. Why everyone knows because Paul is not <clears throat> Paul is not hiding anything about her having a married man boyfriend. Everybody in the town knows her. Yeah. 19 20 year old boyfriend the you know christine um uh, gertrude's boyfriend who's about 20 21 knows about it you know what i mean yeah. everyone knows about it so why are you using this in the film as a catalyst is a why like it's almost like this is the reason why so big got beaten because she was spread we think that she's spreading rumors well like, and that the, makes and, it okay it's and there's that moment too where you know her her boyfriend tells her you know you got to tell your daughter to stay away from that guy he's married and she's like, oh, again, you know, like, okay, you know, I have to talk to her. So I agree. Like, you're so nice to her. You treat her great. And then that one time she basically defends her because the guy is going to rape her. And she's like, don't, but she's pregnant. And then like, it stops, you know, she's now so infuriated. Paul is so angry. I'm going to yeah. make this girl's life a living hell. And I'm going to, tor- you know, like that, that made me mad. Cause I was like, is it a hormonal thing because you're pregnant and now you're full tilt crazy because you think this girl destroyed your life? And then it's only after I forget what happens to her where she's like, you know, Paul is like, Mom, I don't think we should do this to her anymore. She's paid for it now. <laughs> you know, it's like, and you don't even be like, okay, Mom, I lied. You know, like you could have been like, Mom, I lied. Yeah. Well, precisely. And the thing is, <clears throat> and then you get, you know, even when she does come forward, I think she's had enough. It's like, what are you talking about? It's not like, you know, this is like past the middle before, just before, you know, this is like a couple of weeks before she's going to die because of all the shit that's going on with her. Yeah. And like, and now you think she's had enough. Well, I would have thought putting out the cigarette with her, putting the cigarette out on her the first time that was enough payment. I'm yeah. Sorry, not but, the hundredth time you've done it to her. You know? Yeah. And bringing the friends around. And I mean, <clears> the thing is in the film, I mean, the film doesn't even discuss the raping that they did. And the thing is, you know, they did show like, you know, you know, insert this Coke bottle up inside you. And they did show that scene with the Coke bottle break. Yeah, I mean, the break. They, yeah. they didn't show the multiple times that they were raping her with other Coke bottles. Correct. You know? And then even the sister's role in it was very small and murky because mm-hmm. she wasn't as uh, paralyzed, I guess, or wasn't as crippled. So there was times that she was able to get around and move around as, as in, you know, the girl next door. But it wasn't that even to me was so mild. And so part of the gut wrenching moments were when she would use the sister to be like, I'm going to punish her. And she'd be like, no, never mind. Let me just let me take it. Let me, you know, be the one who's going to take the punishment. And that kind of lost its nuance to it as well. Yeah. And there's, you know, and then, you know, before the end of the film, we do get, you know, we do get, we do get this intercutted with a little bit of what goes, what's going on in the courtroom. And the thing is, 
And I thought they were quite well done, actually, the way the kids go. You know, well, I just did what I was told to, and da 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 Which, there is a bit of realness about that. Yeah. Because, you know, and I do think that, you know, they were told to join in, because I don't <clears> think, it, you know, I'm just, you know, if I'm thinking, maybe I'm trying to put in my own emotional compass here, or my own experiences in my life, but when my sister was being punished, I'm not sh- you know, I wouldn't just join in if she's being punished. You know what I mean? It's just not, I mean, I, th- I think if I, if my mom told me to join into it, may- maybe I might have joined. I don't know, but I, I would, I like to sit there and say I wouldn't, but I'm just sitting there saying I wouldn't take it upon myself to join in. I would have to yeah. be encouraged. Well, and I think in those instances, there are, you, you know, you're made an example in front of your siblings. So there's that. But like you said, when you cr- you're crossing the line of hey come over here and grab something and beat her with it you know like that would be like wait what <laughs> i'm sorry excuse yeah. me you don't do what uh, I'm, no i'm good <laughs> i mean i guess it does show a bit of um mob mentality i guess when you get a mob together and it, t- it doesn't take much for a mob to get to go true on one. that's true because once one is encouraged and the others follow along with you know them doing that there was no and i, I think the ending to this was a little bit hard because it's almost like a fantasy, you know, of yeah. her getting out, getting free, running away, going, getting her mom and dad, and then coming back. But where it literally, it was like, okay, no, something's wrong here. She's like, I got to go in and face him. And the parents are like, okay, go ahead. And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> I was like, you're not going to go in there with her? Like, you're just going to be like, sure, go back into the hell you're in? And I was like, something's wrong here. And then you realize it's her. I thought the dream sequence was horrible. I'm sorry. Yeah. The whole thing was horrible. I mean, maybe, you know, maybe if she's running and let's sit there and say that the guy that, the nice guy that she meets in church, who's nice looking, kind of, I guess he was a football, he kind of had that, the all American football kind of look to him. And mm-hmm. then he finds her and he takes her sort of thing to her mom's house. But what we get is get Evan Peters, who's part, who's the ones who's like, takes over tattooing her. I know, who has helped, and, yeah, how, helped her. her. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I don't know, I don't know what, why that choice was there. First of all, I don't understand why they gave her the dream sequence anyway, because I think it was just a way of giving the audience hope for her and being like, oh, my God, she gets out. Because, again, you, we're from our perspective, we knew what happened. We know what's going to happen to her. For those who don't know her story, it's a, this sort of, like, hope. Like, wow, oh, my God, she got away. Thank God. Oh, my God. And now she's getting to her parents. Oh, my God, that's wonderful. And you're probably expect what the audience probably was expecting is her to come back and be like to the villain, I got you now. You did this to me and you're going to pay. And then, oh, crap. No. But see, that's, then, so that's not what happens. And we know that's not what happens. Yeah. But I know? think, I think it, for me, it was a, a bad choice. I think, I mean, I think the most, the strongest point of the film is when they, you know, Sylvia dies, the police show up, and Jenny says, and this is real. This is part of the real story. Jenny goes, get me out of here and I'll tell you everything. Yeah. And I thought that was a lot more powerful than the dream sequence that, oh, she might get away. Because the thing is, I'd rather show them, in this kind of instance, more of the brutality or just talk more about the brutality. Yeah. You have to show it. I, I think it was just a Hollywood tri- trick, you know, to kind of – to get you to believe. It's like, it's like a mystery. Like, oh, you know, she got she – got, say that oh no she didn't she died and and then it's even her in the courtroom where it's like she finally you you hear her narrating and saying but it was too late like i was dead and it's still her narrating the story you know yeah but i do think i think it cheapens it now the thing is if this this was fiction and this wasn't a true story and i think that you can get away with little moments like that but i think because it's a true story and you know and the thing is they just scrape you know, they just they just scrape the scum off the top of the story, sort of thing, and yeah. piece of that. And just in yeah. and, and the movie, I mean, the, the realistic story is so much more brutal and such such more horrific. I mean, you know, prisoners of war 
who had been held in camps and tortured, you know, to death, didn't go through this kind of torture. No. You know what I mean? And I mean, you know, I know that we were up in arms with whatever happened at Catalamo Bay, and which was freaking horrible. But this, has, this is not even a patch of what happened to this girl. And I, and I would tell anyone who's like listening, you know, go to go to Wikipedia and look up the murder of Sylvia uh, Link, Lincoln or Le- Lincoln. Lincoln. Uh, it's you just read it and you just you get more and more nauseous as you read to what happened to her. And you also get to me, I got really I was more upset, too, even about what, you know, the the aftermath, like what the trial and who gets sentenced to what, because a lot of them got off. Like a lot, a lot of them get off for doing this really horrible thing to this this woman or this child, I should say, and it's just a. And some of them became like teachers and like work with kids, and you're like, what? <laughs> you're like, what the hell? Yeah, and uh, there's not a lot of poetic justice that went on here. No, I mean. But there, there's a couple of really odd things in this film as well. I mean, the thing is, you know, to people, people out there listening to this, American Crime is, it is a good film. Unfortunately, when you start holding it up to, and it's supposed to be a factual event of what happened, of the real case. And I think that, that's why we're having a bit of a, a more of a discussion, because this has nothing to do with the, the acting in the film, the film itself. Yeah. It is a very, very good film, and it is very, yeah. very well done. But I guess when you start comparing it to the acting, actual case and i think events, that's where yeah. the, the, the actual events that happened and one of the weird things is that we got um we got the lawyer who is you know from west wing what's his name bradford winford whitford bradley well bradley whitford there we go bradley mm-hmm. whitford from the west bradley wing. Whitford. and he's the prosecuting attorney and and there's one really weird. There's one really weird thing. We got Jenny on the stand, and Je- and he goes, "How come you didn't tell your parents about what was going on with Sylvia in the phone call?" Now, which is kind of weird because this would be something that the attorney of Gertrude would say. It wouldn't be the district attorney like putting like your this, own. Yeah, exactly. Like, let's yeah. put a little bit of blame on you, Jenny, for not doing anything. And yeah. that's what it, that's what it came across as. And another thing is like. All we get in the movie is Jenny, which start, which actually starts things rolling even more, is that we, we get one thing in the movie where we get Jenny and Sylvia making a phone call to their mother. And meanwhile, the father's an asshole. I'm sorry, but I don't know if the father was an asshole in her life, but the father version in this movie of those two yeah. girls, the total was an asshole. horrible yeah. asshole dickhead cunt. I'm sorry. And, and it, it was funny how even uh, Ger- Gertrude was kind of flirting with him and being like, hey, oh, you know, you know you're, you're married, but, you know, if you need me to do anything for you. <laughs> and, like, grabs his leg and, like, oh. <laughs> but... At this point, you know, the torture hasn't gotten to the extreme it's got. So we get this one phone call, and then they, and, you know, Jenny's, mom, you know, when are you coming back? Oh, we're going to be a bit longer. And, um, and then the father's like, oh, that's that. why are you on the phone? Why are they, you know, kind of moaning because the daughter's called, like, the first time that, you know, they haven't seen her forever. I know. <laughs> Two months. Then, they're like, oh, who's yeah, that? <laughs> yeah, with no contact whatsoever. And, and, then, and then we get Sylvia, Ellen Page, and this – you know, the actress going, mom, why was the check late? And then the mom goes, the check wasn't late. You know, and then, then they hang up. See, and then you can see that the mom's a bit upset with the dad that the check being late. And then you're thinking, well, that's the only phone call they had. And of course they get that by apparently they found a bottle and they cast the bottle in to be able to make the phone call, which creates Gertrude thinking that Sylvia's stealing money from the family. Yeah, you're lying. You're not, you, you know, yeah. And then, so then when you get this thing at the end where Jenny's like, oh, you made phone calls to your mother. It's like, when did they make phone calls to your mother? Do you know what I mean? It's just, yeah. it, just, it, it just, it didn't tie up. And it was kind of a weird thing to happen in, in the script form. And another thing that I think that when you look at the real story is that Sylvia and Jenny are two of five kids. There's five kids in the Lycan family. Jenny is a twin. The twins fostered out somewhere else in the neighborhood. They have an older sister that's actually fostered out in the neighborhood as well. And there are scenes where Sylvia and Jenny, Sylvia at one point disappears from school, but before she disappears from school, she sees her older sister in town and tells her older sister about the abuse. And her older sister tells her that, um, oh, it can't be as bad as it is. And then Jenny tells the older sister, like, 
you know, they go, where's Sylvia? And they go, oh, Sylvia's not in school. Sylvia's really sick. But, you know, mom, and you need to contact mom and dad because something's, this is not right. And tells the older sister a little bit of what's going on. And the older sister doesn't do anything. So in the movie, what we get, we get Sylvia and Jenny, you know, two against the world here. But you don't yeah, there's no other siblings. You don't see any other siblings, you know. There's three other siblings. Another thing that we don't really get either is, and I don't know how much of this is artistic license, but if the, fa- the, if the Lycan father was anything like the father portrayed in here, because, you know, we, the movie opens up, we get, you know, Sylvia and Jenny with their mom and they're going to church. The father shows up, and the first thing that um, that Sylvia says there, oh, where have you been? Like, he hasn't been around for ages, which I don't know if this is the real case or not, because I'm not sure, has he been off at work or whatever's going on? And he goes, oh, and he tells the mother, like, oh, we got a chance to go on this carnival circuit, and it could, you know, it, we'll get, we get to the state fair, and we might, it might turn into something else where we can make money. And the mother tells the two girls, go in, go in there, I'll be in and after you. And I need to go talk to your father to sort things out. And the father's, and then when, then you get Sylvia listening to it, and the father, father, and the mother goes, no, no, I can't leave the girls this time. You know, they're going to be starting school. They haven't made friends yet, and blah, dee, da, dee, da. And the father goes, if we go off together, maybe with the girls not with us, we won't fight, we'd fight as less. Yeah. Uh, okay. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, you two are the worst things and we cannot have you around to be a, in a happy marriage. <laughs> and it's, it's a weird way to paint this sort of thing. No, I know. I, I, like, I mean, I, maybe, maybe there's some, I mean, it's really hard to find anything about the Liking family I, whatsoever. We don't have, we found, you, you can do a lot of research and find out what happened to Jenny, but you don't really know yeah. too much about the parents whatsoever. Well, and I felt like if that scene, particularly when they're going into the church, I felt, see, I read it a different way. I read it as, the mom bringing her daughters to church and the husband is coming back and it's almost like they're estranged or they're separated. Cause yeah. she just is like, what do you want? Oh, you're back again. Like kind of like, Oh, you know, you, you know, you've been gone. Yeah. And he's just like, Oh, yeah, you know, well, let's, let's try to work this out. Let's try to be, you know, let's try to look, I got this job offer and I think we, we work really well together. So it's almost like a career proposal. And she's just like, well, uh, you know, and get rid of the and, girls and keep, so we can work on our marriage. You know, yeah, it, it, it does give that kind of feeling. And but the thing is, when you understand the story about what what the family's going through, there's nothing that indicates that these people that this ever went on. It's kind yeah. of a weird thing. And then we get, and then we get, and then the mom goes, "I'll be back. I'll be in. See you later." Like into the church, right? The mom disappears for most of the movie after this. We don't even see the well, mom. That, well, that's a weird thing because, right, they go to leave the church and they're like, oh, mom's going to come get us. And she's like, oh, I'll, you know, the Gertrude, I'll take you. I'll bring, you know, I'll bring you back and I'll just let them know, you know, I have you. Get on like, the bus. What? <laughs> get on the church the bus. Yeah, they get on the church bus. Let's go, you know. And he's kind of wondering, like, where are they going? Because at this point, they don't get offered to go to Gertrude's house until they're on the bus. And that's when they meet. Um, the, the younger daughters. Yeah. And then they go, and then, you know, Gertrude turns around, what are you guys doing? Oh, we're just going to play. We'll be quiet, mom. Okay, come on in, blah, 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 sort of thing. And then, then you get the father showing up. I don't know how he knew where freaking children were. <laughs> it's like he I know. The house. It's, it's, it's really, it's just weird, you know. I guess it's it's a small mm-hmm. town, and so I guess he asked her, I don't know. It's really well, weird. Well, it can't be that small of a town because they have a church bus that picks people up and takes them to church and drops them back <laughs> off. So, obviously, it's got to be a bit big. I mean, it's, it's sort the of The mobile. <laughs> yeah. But he, I don't know. I just think, you know, it might have been interesting to give a, a little bit of detail about the Lickens family because apparently, you know, as I said before, there were other brothers and sisters, and you know, that they had, and they would be they were carnival workers, and they would send their kids normally to the grandparents or family members, and in this instance, they gave it to Gertrude, and they're going to give her twenty dollars a week. Now, the problem basically I have is with the parents is like, you just left your kid. With and I know twenty quid, twenty dollars might have been a lot in nineteen sixty five, but it wasn't that. Excuse me, it wasn't that much. And it's twenty pounds, twenty dollars a week, or is it twenty dollars a month? Uh, twenty dollars a month. Okay, that's not a lot. And now, and well, then, for see, that time, it is. Yeah, you actually have to think it is because, like, 
It is, it, but it is. It because- he was remember she was like starving, and he's like, "Oh, here," and he puts out like two nickels, like, and he got like a soda and, and a hot dog, and I was like, "Oh wait, I'm in the fifties. Never mind." Yeah. Like I was like, "How do you get basically two hot dogs, two sodas for ten cents?" Like, wait, what? Yeah, I know what what kind of economy. But I'm saying, like in yeah. 1965, I mean, things weren't that cheap. I mean, my parents divorced in 1972, which is seven years later. And, oh, my, so and my, I was actually reading the Wikipedia. So it says the Lynx parents' marriage was unstable. The family moved frequently, and the parents had financial difficulties. Yeah. So they they were they. So that is pretty true then. Yeah, they had financial difficulties, and they had marriage difficulties, but. I'm just sitting there saying to to wide sweep through the issue a little bit because I just find it it would have been I guess if I guess if you're gonna do a little it might have maybe even have some words and you know written words across the screen a little bit about them because what we uh, get we get this paper we get this cardboard cutouts of these two people who leave their kids for no kind yeah of- but by the way how they knew Gertrude is because she ironed their clothes so that's how they did know her so it wasn't like okay it wasn't like a random person on the street it says to earn money Link's baby sat and iron at the same kind of work that was done by Gertrude so they they, they basically did the same thing she did. Oh, so they're in competition with each other. For yeah, iron. exactly. Church, the church is ironing. Yeah, I don't know. And then I'm just saying the, the way the scenes are played out. And, you know, and I do think that, you know, I, ha- I, I just have a whole problem. Because at the end of the day, even though Gertrude did all the horrific things, I do think the parents have to take, I mean, the parents have to take a little bit of responsibility here. You left your yeah. kid with a freaking stranger, paid $20 a month, which, you know, my like my parents divorced. My dad would pay my mom ten dollars a a week for us kids. So that'd be thirty dollars, and then an extra twenty on top for alimony, which is fifty. And my mom struggled in nineteen seventy two with that amount of money. And that you know what I mean. And this is twenty dollars a month. This was yeah. seven years before that. So and then you know then you're leaving your kids with a mother who's struggling. Well, and isn't that weird though too? It's like so you're. They're struggling financially because that's what they're leaving to go work basically and get a job. Yeah. So where are you getting the twenty dollars <laughs> to like pay a person? Yeah, to, like that does it just doesn't make sense. And then know? why leave why leave your kids with someone who's str- struggling probably worse than you are because exactly they, you can tell that she's struggling. I mean, she's got a baby, a newborn baby. She's having difficulty with the newborn baby. You, you see a lot of that. I mean, you got a woman who's on the edge. I mean, you know. And obviously, everyone knows this woman's on medication. And if, I mean, if you go by this film, I, I think and, I, and obviously, people know that she's kind of getting around town. You know, she has a younger boyfriend and has a baby from him, and she has other. Nineteen sixty-five. She's she's got a kid. She's an unmarried mother at sixty-five with like you know illegitimate and other illegitimate children. Yeah. So, she, so she's not the cream of society here. Yeah. And you know, and the you know, if you go by this film, now I'd. You know, I don't know how much of this is artistic license or how much of this is real, realistically. But if you go, if you're taking the artistic license as fact, she says to the woman, "Do you have any ironing? I'm feeling better now." She goes, "I'm on my meds now." And you're thinking, <laughs> you're like, obviously, really? Well, I mean, obviously. So that, therefore, that means that's not a hidden secret that this woman's yeah. on meds. And stuff. Well, that's what I'm saying. I mean, can you imagine safer. she's saying this openly to all of her clients, and it's like, oh yeah, let's go to let's get the let's give our daughters a stable Mabel over here and hope she doesn't kill them. Yeah, <laughs> Jeez. You know, and then you're leaving your kids there, and then and then you got and then, you know, and then we get this vision of the mother who's supposed to be like this very caring mother. You know, they kind of show her as much as they could. You know, she's only got three, four scenes in the whole thing. Most of those are courtroom scenes like shaking her head and crying her tears for the loss of Sylvia. Yeah. But, you know, she goes, you know, she gives the kids and she's like, pleasant, okay, I'll see you later. And then he kiss, you know, calls Jenny something and calls Sylvia cookie. And then they disappear. And so you don't really know a lot about them. But yeah. unfortunately, the movie does paint them as these really fucking horrible people. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And it maybe it would have been nice to have a thing. And I think it would have been nice to know more about the liking family a little bit. I'm not sitting there saying you have to have like a half hour dedicated to them, but two or three minutes wouldn't have hurt, wouldn't have hurt to actually flush them out a little bit and flush out the other kids or, you know, or even, you know, 
or something, or just have word that, you know, the Lycans sent, you know, Sylvia and Jenny live there and their other three kids were living in town, living somewhere else or something. Yeah. yeah. You know, I agree. Because, yeah. But I, yeah, I, it's just, it's just a bit, I just, it's just kind of weird what they decide to present and what they don't decide to present. And I guess that's the problem when you do a dramatization of any realistic events. And I guess the same thing, like, as we discussed in our normal episode of, you know, book to film sort of thing when they take a book and then they constitute that into a film and what they leave in and what they leave out, I guess. But it did. Yeah. My problem is, as I said before, my only problem is showing Gertrude a little bit of, a little bit too much empathy a little sometimes. Yeah. They humanize her so much that you're kind of, you, I mean, you do feel bad for her because there's a point when, you know, I forget what happened to her, but she there's like an emotional moment to where she just is like you could tell she's struggling, and then like you, but you you know, again I saw this movie after seeing um, the the girl yeah. next door, and I was like I have no sympathy for you. <laughs> You're an yeah. evil woman. <laughs> you killed this woman. You killed this girl. Um, but they, they they do give you these moments where you're like, oh, I kind of feel bad for her. You know, oh no, you know. Um. Yeah, another problem I had with it is that after Gertrude goes to jail for 20 years and she's in the cell and Sylvia's ghost appears. Yeah. You know, and this is apparently, you know, we've, I mean, this, and this is kind of weird because we get the voiceover of Sylvia talking about, you know, what happened to each person and, you know, and let's face it, their jail cell, their jail cell time did not fit the crime in this case at all. It just, it, yeah. I don't know. I don't know if this shows how bad the judicial system can be sometimes, or I'm not sure if this is like if this is meant to be a comment on it or whatever. But you kind of get this quick, and this is Ellen Page doing her mumbling acting. So you get, yeah. you know, she's mumbling her way through this sort of thing, and which mm -hmm. is. It probably would have been nicer because it's a voiceover that she could have been a bit more clear. <laughs> she's saying, yeah, I mean, like, like, especially when she was in the cell with her, she it would have been like, "Hey, girl." You're in here for a reason, right? <laughs> yeah. You know what you did. But but this but you get this voiceover of Sylvia talking sort of thing, which I think, you know, I think this is, they probably could have done without this and probably just done what they did like in Helter Skelter where they just kind of like had the words up on the screen and showing each of them sort of thing. I personally would have loved for them to like kind of do a fast forward to Jenny where she's, she's reading uh, or she clips out the obituary paper when uh, Gertrude dies and she calls her mom and she's like, good news. The damn old Gertrude died. <laughs> I'm happy about that. Yeah. Well, I can't, I can hardly blame her. I tell you, I, I probably would have tried to murder her myself. Yeah. But in the film, I mean, so you got Gertrude in jail, the ghost of Sylvia pops up and this is supposed to be Gertrude taking responsibility because we find out that Gertrude, He's going to be released 20 years later and five years before she dies, because she, she dies five years after she's released, that she's going to take responsibility. And she looks at Sylvia's ghost and mumbles, I'm sorry. Like, like what? What? Like, yeah. You know, it's a bit like, you know, you know, like when a kid does something bad, you tell them to apologize to someone. They go, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. You're thinking like, this is, you know, and it's like, it's, there's no sorriness in her eyes. So it was just kind of a bit weird. And then, yeah. we, and of course, the film closes with Sylvia's ghost going to be at the carnival on the merry-go-round, sort of. Thing. I know that was that was weird. I have to admit that. Like, oh, I I forget what she says. Something like, but now, but now I'm on the merry-go-round. I'm like, what? I'm like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> like, because it's the only it's the only place that she ever felt safe. And I think anywhere aside from that fucking house, you'd probably feel safe. <laughs> I'm just saying. To be honest, <laughs> I need, I need, God. I mean, and and this is another thing that's weird about the whole the Lycan family is that after the court case and everything like this, is, after this happens, Jenny doesn't go back to live with her mom and dad. She lives with the prosecuting attorney's family and they bring her up. Oh, yeah. You know, so her family are scum. I'm sorry, sorry. but her, the Lycan, the Lycan family are scum. And I know that we get visions of them like being torn apart and stuff like this, but were they really that torn apart? Because let's freaking face it. I mean, even after all that, all this stuff that Jenny saw her sister being maimed, tortured, raped, mm -hmm. going through all these inhuman things that anybody 
should never ever encounter ever in their whole life. She's seen this happen to her sister who's protecting her. The girl was so dehydrated that she couldn't cry. Yeah. And, you know, that's a Testifying on the stand, you have, you know, they got her testifying on the stand. They, you know, she's supposed to be back with her family. And what did they do? After the court case is over with, she goes and lives with the public attorney, defense yeah. attorney, who bring her up. So she's not yeah. even around her parents anymore. <clears throat> yeah. what, what does that tell you about them? Well, yeah, I mean, and, and I'm actually even surprised the wife is with the husband because in, it's, in a way it's his fault. She wanted to stay there, and he was like, "Let's go, let's go to this, you know, let's go to the circus, and we'll work." I'm surprised you see them arm in arm because I would feel like there's a bit of anger and resentment and hatred that you would have towards your, you know, a spouse that you're already rocky with, right? Mm-hmm. Now, I mean, come on, that that doesn't create a wedge or divide. I don't know what does, you know, for having your daughter being brutalized and murdered. I mean, the interesting thing about the Lycan case is that um, in 1965, the people who tortured and brutally murdered her through a course of two months, this all happened in two months, which oh. is even worse. God. But, I mean, Paula was 17, Stephanie was 15, John was 12, Marie was 11, Shirley was 10, John Jr. was eight. And then, of course, Dennis Lee was just born, so he had nothing about it. And this is just the family that's involved. This has nothing to do with the actual kids that who were coming in from the neighborhood, how old they were. Yeah. So we're, I mean, the ages right there, you're thinking, you know, not only did the mother do this and make her kids do this, but they pretty much just, she just ripped out their whole childhood. Can yeah. you imagine, like, can you be, imagine 11 years old you know, or six years old asking to torture it? Now, the, the Liking family is a bit interesting because they had two sets of twins. And yeah. the, two, the three that I didn't mention was Diana and Danny, who were two years older than Sylvia. And the youngest one were Jenny and Benny. These names. Jenny and Benny. <laughs> <laughs> ben and Jerry. <laughs> and Jenny is the one with polio who went to go live with Sylvia in Gertrude's house. And then Benny was the other one that they were farming out here or there. So they used to farm out their kids all the time. And, you know... I do wonder, you know, I do think people who are, might be, you know, I'm sorry, but if I'm going to offend anyone, if you're a pro-lifer, you might want to watch the Sylvia Lycan story because sometimes oh, I think people, people probably shouldn't have children, you know, sort of thing. I but, was also just reading too, because like it talked about the house and all this happened that um, <clears throat> they basically, it was been vacant and was run down for many years. There were some who were discussing of purchasing it and renovating and using it as a woman's shelter they couldn't get the funds, and so they demolished a house in 2009. The property now is a, char- a church parking lot. <laughs> oh. it's, uh, uh. Well, I mean, the thing, I, I mean, I think another interesting thing is the people, the only kids, all the kids took part of this, but they only charged four kids with the crime of Sylvia Liking, and that's yeah. Paula and John, who were 17 and 13 at the time, Richard Hobbs, which was a neighbor who was 15, and Coy, an, the boyfriend, who was 15. Yeah. Well, and here's the interesting thing about Paula. So Paula actually had the baby and named it Gertrude after her mother because she loved her so much. And then um, she tried to escape the prison twice and then basically was up for parole and she got parole and she worked as a, a school counselor for 14 years. I mean, I, <laughs> like, but she lied. So basically they fired her, but uh, in my mind, I'm like, how in the hell would you even? Because this is like uh, in 2000, or no, uh, she was fired in 2012. But yeah. it's still, like, how do you do what? The, they must have the worst background checks available. Like, <laughs> not know. Oh, by the way, um, it's crazy. Well, I mean, Gertrude was in prison for 14, you know, and, for, and 14 years of those times, the, uh, the 20 years. She was a model prisoner and she was working in the sewing shop and everyone, she was considered the den mother and everyone used to call her mom. I know. It, it, it literally, you just, oh, yeah. You know, and when she was being, when she's supposed to get parole, they got over 40,000 signatures and that still didn't stop her from getting parole. They should have granted parole. And yeah, I mean, the thing is, I mean, when you see an actual picture of what she looked like when she was paroled, I mean, this woman is hard looking. Yeah. 
But I do think that um, it's quite interesting to find out what happened to some of the kids. Yeah, I mean, uh, she, looks, <laughs> she, look, she looks like one of these horrible evangelicalists who will literally like hit you with the Bible. Tammy, Tammy Faye Baker without the makeup. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, it's quite weird that most of the people involved in this story died quite young, though. Yeah, which, in their 50s, a lot of them in their 50s. Well, Jenny died of a heart attack at age 54. Um, you know, the mother, Richard Hobbs, died of cancer at the age of 21, lung cancer. One of the boys that beat her. Um, Coy um, got, was in and out of prison. Um, he, he was later charged with the murder of two men, but was acquitted. And he died of a heart attack in 2007 at the age of 56. Yeah. Paul is the one that seemed, the one that started, well, according to this film, instigated everything, which yeah, take a bit of, you know, take that with a bit of salt. But she seems to be the only one alive. I've definitely disappeared. The rest of the kids, I mean, they all changed their names, which is quite interesting. Yeah, but, I mean, it, it says like all of the, the younger kids were, the, you know, the juveniles, all their cases were dropped. So basically none of them. And it says, you know, married, has children, grandchildren. She Oh, so she died at 44. Ooh. Yeah. And yeah. Leper, one of the other children, um, died in 2010 in Indianapolis at the age of 56. So they yeah. all, and the Lycan sister Diana um, and her husband Cecil, were reported missing by their son yeah. after that. So even the Lycan family themselves have had nothing but tragedy. I know. Um, well, I, and it just kind of goes to show you, like, you know, you can't escape. This This girl went through what she went through and, and was murdered, but then that sort of, it, it followed them. It all followed them and haunted them in their own way and, and killed them, you know? I mean, the weirdest, I mean, you know, I think that, you know, to end this, I th to end this discussion I think this is going to be the the weirdest way to end it but I think it's probably the most truthful way to end it when Gert was going to her parole hearing and what she said was they gave her parole for and she was released after a lifetime sentence for and only several 20 years she says I'm not sure what role I had in it because I was on drugs I never really knew her I take full responsibility for whatever happened to Sylvia so it's and like I'm sorry not sorry you know yeah. basically and so they released her on good behavior um, on a three to one, and she was released. But this is like, but she said, I never really knew her. This is I, a girl that you tortured, raped, brutally, you know, tattooed, you branded her, um, Coke bottles, you know, so whole chance. You, you kind of wonder who the state you know, defense person, because I, in my mind, I would have been like, so she was that forgettable. Mm -hmm. Got it. You know, like basically you killed someone or you helped kill someone, but you don't even remember them. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, but if I tortured someone in my basement, I would. You would I, remember. I would have more of a recollection. I'm sorry. I'm just, yeah. I just find it a bit weird. There may be, you know, maybe, but then in maybe in the 80s, you know, when they were releasing her, maybe we had this thing in 1985, maybe we had this thing about redemption and. You know, you know, she didn't know what she's doing, and maybe oh, so wasn't she a poor drug addict? Blah blah blah, blah for whatever. Well, I mean, it's also how many people because of the prison. Most of the people, the women in the prison, are calling her mom. Hmm. Did they, you know, did they step up for her and say, you know, regardless of what she's done, she, well, look what she's done for me or us, you know, and who knows? I mean. I want to believe that everyone has redeemable qualities or has the ability to change, but you also have to own what you did. And like it, that comment to me is especially unsettling to be like, you know, I guess I did this. If you said I did it, I don't really remember. So I'm sorry. <laughs> like, no, like, like what the hell? I, I don't know. I mean, I just, I do think that if you do something like this or you do meditated murder, I'm not talking about manslaughter or involuntary manslaughter, but I think if you go out and you plan a murder or a torture or anything yeah. to this extreme, I do believe that lifetime should be lifetime. Yeah. And I agree. Part, part of me even thinks death sentence, but you know, but that's well, but even, I, I think, so I think even that though, I think that's an easier out too for people who do heinous crimes like that, you know, who commit, just just brutalize you know like for instance you know not to go off off the you know rail here um the guy who killed his wife pregnant wife and two kids 
you know, mm. people would say, kill him, get rid of him, death sentence. And it's like, well, this guy, I mean, he like, he did some pretty horrible things. Mm. Uh, so you're giving him an easy out. Yeah, in, in a I, way, it's like, it's, you know, he's, it's an easy out for him because he did all this horrible things. It's kind of a weird thing. I mean, if we go back to like, let's say Charles Manson, and because their death sentence was, I'm not sitting there saying I'm in favor of death sentence or not in favor of death sentence. Yeah. I'm not quite, sometimes I'm in favor of it and sometimes I'm not. It'll depend. Same. On the day. Yeah. You know, and I'm just thinking of the taxpayers here trying to save the money. But no. Yeah, I'm exactly. Because <laughs> they have to put it <laughs> somewhere like, and you have to, you're paying for it. So, you know. But sometimes I wonder, like in big cases, I'm talking about the big cases, if death sentencing wouldn't be better to a certain degree. Because if we look at the, like, the Helter Skelter, where they went from death sentence to lifetime imprisonment and then they become like these anti-heroes and people are writing to them and want you know and they're getting married and they're having families like Texas yeah got married and you know he's a pre and for some reason they all turn to god afterwards i don't know if this is the health of parole or they really believe this it's hard to tell but i think it's but, their easy way of being like well here's my redemption i'm gonna read a i'm gonna pick up the bible and i'm gonna become a christian or i'm gonna come you know i'm gonna start talking about the word of god to people i mean susan atkins did it tex watson did it they all god it. came to me and he healed me and i now i see that everything i've done you know and it's like mm -hmm. and i think and my, I guess when I when I'm in favor of the death sentence is when cases like that when, um, you know, and you know I'm not going to re rehash what the last episode, but in Helter Skelter, I'm sorry, I don't think they were brainwashed because if you tell a kid to do something they don't want to do it, they'll do a half-assed version of it. Yeah, these people loved what they did. They loved. They it. relished. They relished they, it. Yeah, yeah, they relished. I mean, this went far and above anyone. I mean, this is a bit like telling your kid to do their math homework, and they and they do the algebra problems for the next two years. Yeah, I mean, it's that kind of thing, you know. Well, and again, in this situation, how many months? Two months? Yeah, that's a lot of. That's not a. That's not a, a short amount of time. That's a lot of time to do the damage that you're doing to someone and enjoy it. You're well, they, savoring these moments of torturing. Someone. Oh, they relished it. I mean, they, they look forward to going home from school and doing this. They loved yeah. it. They yeah. enjoyed this. And, and to be honest, after everything that you read about this case, not one single one of them ever says anything about any kind of remorse. Yeah. And, none, of, none. and they're, they're upset. They're not upset because what they did to Sylvia. They're upset because they got caught. Exactly. Yeah. And, and with things like this, that's why I sometimes I have belief in maybe a death sentence only only in times like this. I'm not sitting there saying that the death sentence should come back and forth, but it does make me question my belief on the death sentence sometimes because the case is like this. Yeah. I mean, you know, well, no I would also say, what do, you do with those, what do you do with those people? Because what if there's a potential of them getting out? And doing it again and doing it to someone else, you know, and so you do kind of, you, yeah. You well, it's kind not, of, but, but it's not, it's not even the chance of them going out and maybe, maybe, you know, maybe if you let the Manson gang out or, I mean, let's face it. I mean, Gertrude and her family, uh, you know, they, 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 you know, they lived short lives, but you yeah. know, they, they didn't, they, you know, they didn't repeat this process, but at the same time, they took someone's life and uh, someone who was young, someone who was nice, someone who was innocent. I mean, yeah. from, innocent. I mean, you know, maybe so. I mean, you know, for sake of argument's sake, let's say, let's say that maybe Sylvia wasn't as nice. Because let's say when someone dies, let's be honest, they go to sainthood. You know, it doesn't matter yeah. what they did, or would they become this, this kind of a saint sort of thing. And, well, and I think if I, remember, it, that's, that's, if I remember reading, she did steal something. Like, I think she sold some sort of track suit because she, her, because. She well, couldn't she need, afford it and yeah, she sold it. And, yeah, because um, Gertrude wouldn't buy it. She needed a gym kit for school. School, so she yeah. filled a, uh, a gym kit so she because otherwise the she's getting in trouble in school and they, they're yelling at her so yeah. she thought that if she stole the gym kit that would be less punishment from gertrude than being kicked out of school for not having a gym kit apparently yeah, yeah. But, but that's but, also teenage angst in, in my opinion that's yeah i mean the thing is let's just say that she, let's say let's take the statehood away from sylvia and let's just say she was a normal girl and may and let's just say that you know, for argument's sake, that she told everyone everyone in school that Paula was a slut and she was pregnant. Let's just sit there and say that, you know, let's take a turn. Yeah. Even to the fact that apparently this never happened, but let's sit there and yeah. say that she was like that. It still doesn't constitute what happened to her. Yeah, you know it I mean? still doesn't make it, any of it right. And not, like, there's no one that could say, well, yeah, she kind of doesn't know. Like, not, yeah. there is not the level of what she went through and how she was tortured. There ain't no way that that's right. Yeah. yeah. And that's why I think. You know, and 
from all accounts, whether it's from people that knew Sylvia, people that went to school with her, um, the journals that they found that she wrote. I mean, the opening thing where she's talking talking about being on the merry-go-round that actually comes from one of Sylvia's journals when she was younger. And this is the ways she viewed life oh. that, um, and I think that the way that she died, that sometimes it does make me question whether about, you know, whether death sentencing should yeah, be there illegal. for some people or yeah. not. But I do, you know, I do have to say that in, um, in a six foot tall, 1.8 meter block of granite was dedicated to Sylvia in June 2001 as a memorial to Lycan in Willard Park, 1700 East Washington Street. The dedication was attended by several hundred people, which basically means that, you know, we're looking at something that's, you know, almost three centuries since this happened that she's still well remembered, it seems like, yeah. small yeah. in this town. I do wonder why it was a block of granite. I don't know if they ran out of money and they can fire a sculpture. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, this is just easier. Just put a block of granite. <laughs> yeah. for, for liking. I mean, um, unless they just didn't want an effigy of her, you know, to be like, you know. I suppose so, but I still think a block of granite is kind of a weird thing. I mean, I maybe agree. a block, maybe like, maybe like a living tree. Yeah, like exactly. Is. A block of granite is like, <laughs> just, like just a cold block of stone <laughs> yeah i mean it, really yeah. speak about what her personality was like. i just don't think they thought about that <laughs> that far yeah. they're like oh wait what should we do i don't know block of granite sure <laughs> <laughs> yeah so what we'll do is before we go let's have our final thoughts so john what are your final thoughts of an american crime and the girl next door uh it's just a tough it's a very very tough story it's gut-wrenching um I, you know, I just, it's hard to believe that there are cruel people out in the world. Um, and this is just one of those, or these the films do sort of justice to her life to, to, so that way people don't forget what happened to her and what happens to other people like her. Um, it's important to know that, you know, that that exists out there and that you always have to kind of protect yourself and protect the ones you love. And to, when you see something, say something. And um, it's, it is a difficult movie or movies to watch, um, but it's worth it in the sense of, of remembering that this something happened to someone like this and that that doesn't kind of go unnoticed. And, you know, these crimes for some of these people, they, I don't think that were, um, they shouldn't, have got off the way they did and they did. And uh, this in a way is sort of a stick in it to them. Like, well, you might have been able to get out and move on, but we're not going to move on. And we're going to, we're going to remember this, this girl. And B it's kind of weird because they're both very, very good films. And I know that we criticized the American crime, but we didn't criticize the film for the film for what it is. We criticized some of the facts that weren't portrayed in the film. So I think it's important to make that distinction. I do like both films. I think both films are very well, well done. I think it is interesting to watch the two films um, within a short, I don't think you can watch them back to back because it's a bit too much. But it is quite interesting to see a fictionalized account versus a, 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 apparently a realistic account of the same story. And it's quite interesting to look at those two. I do think that, I do think that, I think this is one of those cases where fact is hell of a lot scarier than fiction. Yeah. And I do believe that if it keeps Sylvia Likens' memory alive, I think that they're worth seeing. It is an interesting case. And it is a case that really turns your stomach and makes you look at the human race as something that you don't want to see it for what it is sometimes. And it's, it upsets me. It's one of those films that ups, they really upset me. But the Lycan story obsessed me even more. And when you start doing a bit more research, which we've done, and, and you do look at the murder photos are online. Um, the stories of what, you know, what the kids end up looking like are online. It's also scary that when you do look at the kids that were involved, 
They were nice looking kids. They looked like normal everyday kids. They weren't monster demon looking children. They didn't look like Damien Thorne from The Omen. They didn't look like they didn't look like Linda Blair after you know she's been transformed in The Exorcist. Yeah. They looked like normal everyday kids of nineteen sixty five. They didn't yeah. look like they would have them in it. And I think that makes it even scarier. Um, and I think it's you know, I know this is part of our back to reality month and I have to sit there and say that you know, after covering Helter Skelter and this doing this film, Sylvia liking these films, and then next month we do Rope this deal that looks at the Leopold Low case from the 1950s. I have to sit there and say that sometimes reality is a hell of a lot scarier than some of the other shit that we meant that we've done, and I don't, I don't mean yeah. shit in a bad way. I'm talking shit like fictional, uh, fictional shit that we've done. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, you know, we looked at the Amityville Horror. Well, Amityville Horror is basically the truth. But I mean, if you look at you know The Road and other films that we've done, Planet of the Apes, or you know stuff that we've done recently, The Innocents, and all the other stuff that we've done. I have to say that this month has probably been the ones that have actually haunted me through every kind of aspect of the day I'm, from my day-to-day living at the moment. And we held yeah. Skelter, the three, two and a half weeks I spent reading that and doing research on Charles Manson and the family and everything that concerned that and the murders and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I mean, I was dreaming about that shit for ages. Um, and now Sylvia Liking, I mean... I watched The Girl Next Door. I watched that at the beginning of the week. I watched American Crime this morning because it's just taken me a whole week to get the courage to watch this film. And I'm haunted by it. And I'm going to be haunted by it for a long time. And yeah, yeah. so it just shows you how much reality sucks. (laughs) (laughs) And with that, um, an American crime could be happening right now to The Girl Next Door. You might hear a scream or the sounds of a fight taking place. It's easier to not get involved, but it's tougher to live with knowing that you could have done something to prevent the unspeakable. Pick up the phone, dial 911 because you just might be saving a life. Okay, that's my PSA for the day. (laughs) To find... To find all of our past episodes, check out our social and podcast platforms, as well as become a patron and read our reviews of books to screens and everything in between. Head on over to our website at llpodcast.com. Don't forget to sign up for our monthly newsletter as well, where you can win one of our amazing limited season one t-shirts. For our next podcast, we'll be wrapping up our theme of the month, Time uh, Time to Face Reality with Alfred Hitchcock's film, Rope. As always, thank you for downloading, sharing, and liking the Literary License Podcast. Until next time, adios. Bye. Adios. Bye. 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 (laughs) Yeah. Gertrude Banachevsky, however, had a different story. I did never beat that girl. Never. She was beat up on by other girls. In fact, my own daughter stopped her in the jaw and broke her wrist. And uh, so, I mean, there you go. And, and, and girls around the neighborhood beat her up, bloodied her nose. I, one girl broke her nose, in fact, I think. Were you ever in contact with the police on any of these occasions? Well, in the last two weeks, uh, in fact, um, uh, I think if, if you'd talk to my daughters, I, I'd ask them that uh, the, the children's father and I are divorced. And he's a policeman in Meech Grover was. And uh, I've asked the girls repeatedly, call their dad, ask them what to do. And in fact, I, I asked Jenny, I said, Jenny, and, and I told Sylvia, I said, Sylvia, I'm going to have to call the police or somebody because I can't have any responsibility. But the police were called only one time. And according to Hobb... Well, she, uh, she, I'll come in in about, she come up from the basement, and we noticed she was cold and everything, so we carried her upstairs, give her a warm bath and artificial respiration. When, well, she stopped breathing. See, we gave her a warm bath, and then she stopped breathing. And so I gave her artificial respiration for about 10 minutes. And then uh, I went and called the police. By the time police found the girl, she had been dead some 8 to 12 hours. Like a comet blazing across the evening sky. Too soon, like a rainbow fading in the twinkling of an eye, gone too soon. 
shining sparkly and splendidly bright here one day gone one night like the loss of sunlight on a cloudy afternoon Sandy Beach Gone to soon Like a perfect flower That is just beyond your reach Gone to soon Inspired to delight Here one day Gone one night Like a sunset Dying with the rising of the moon Tonight marks a very special anniversary here in Indiana. It was exactly 50 years ago today that a young woman's death turned into an international incident, inspiring at least four books, a play, and two movies. 16-year-old Sylvia Likens was found on this night back in 1965. Police called her murder one of the worst crimes they had ever seen, finding the teen beaten, tortured, burned with cigarettes, and eventually starved to death. Lycan's parents left her with Gertrude Banaszewski, who one month prior, and eventually she and several of her children were convicted of the teen's murder.